Okay, if I can uh, call the meeting to order and welcome you to this um, meeting of the Public Petitions Committee. Um, I should um, indicate that Brian Whittle has given his apologies and that his substitute, Edward Mountain, is here in his place, so welcome. We also hope I'm expecting that Neil Finlay, MSP, may be joining us for this item uh, later on. The first agenda item, then, is a continued petition on uh, 165 in the review of Section 11 of the Children's Scotland Act 1995. So this is a roundtable evidence session on Petition 165, which calls for a review of Section 11 on the Children's Scotland Act 1995. And we're joined this morning by five witnesses. So can I welcome to the meeting Stuart Valentine of Relationship Scotland, Ian Maxwell of Families Need Fathers, Pauline McIntyre from Children and Young People's Commissioner Scotland, Dr Marcia Scott of Scottish Women's Aid, and Vary McGowan from ASSIST. Um, and the purpose of holding an evidence session in this format is to allow for a discussion of issues between all of the participants. However, in the interest of managing the meeting and making sure everyone gets to contribute, I would ask all participants to indicate to me if they wish to say something. And to ensure that we make the most of our time this morning, we won't have any opening statements, but do, of course, have copies of the written submissions we have received on the petition. And once we've concluded our questions, ministers, members will have a discussion to agree our next action on the petition. So I would be grateful if witnesses could bear with us during that discussion. Um, and I'll, I'll maybe kick off with the opening question. As I say, this is a, it's an attempt to try and have a dialogue and a conversation rather than a more formal setting on an issue I think that the committee was quite struck by. It was something that we hadn't been aware of in terms of contact centres and the, the points that the petitioner had made to us. It's quite useful, I think, to explore these questions with you. So... There are a number of issues to discuss this morning, one of which is external regulation of child contact centres. But before we get to that subject, I'd like to start by asking about the nature of cases in which contact centres is involved. Relationship Scotland states in its submission that there has been, a, quote, an increasing complexity of cases seen over recent years. So I wonder if I could ask Stuart to start us off by outlining um, a bit about the type of cases and their associated complexities after which I'll open up the discussion to other participants. Absolutely, thank you, Convener. Um, Relationship Scotland operate 46 child contact centres across the country, and each year around about 2,000 children are supported to see their non-resident parent through our contact centres. I think it's fair to say over recent years, the, the cases that have come to us um, have got far more complex issues attached to them. Um, the families who see us you now increasingly have issues around drug and alcohol dependence. Uh, domestic abuse is clearly a factor as well in terms of the cases that come to us. Uh, and in general terms, it would appear that the statutory organisations such as social work, the NHS and others um, are less able to deal with many of the issues that are, that are being faced by families in Scotland uh, and many more of these issues are being passed over to agencies like Relationship Scotland and others to try to deal with. In terms of the cases that come to child contact centres, um, the starting point is a relationship breakdown. There's been a breakdown of relationship between the two parties, the, the mum and the dad, uh, and they've not been able to resolve the future arrangements for seeing the, their children. 70% of the cases that come to child contact centres will have been referred either by the courts or by solicitors. So the starting point for the cases that come to us are highly uh, conflictual situations with a whole range of issues. Now, 10% of the cases that come to us uh, come for what's called supervised uh, child contact, which means that would be a, you know, one family at a time. Um, that would be supervised by two trained members of staff of Relationship Scotland, uh, and the whole contact is observed very carefully within the room. Um, I, and if should anything happen during that contact, should, for example, if it was a dad who was the non-resident parent, if they asked any questions about the mum, for example, uh, those types of conversations would be, would be stopped straight away. So if anything inappropriate was happening during a, a supervised contact, our staff would intervene uh, straight away. There would be, in those cases for supervised contact, there would be reports would be written for the court, which would be factual accounts of how the child contact session uh, progress and our, our staff would be obviously well trained and well versed in terms of reporting back. Um, it's clear I think across the country that these situations are very difficult in a sense to manage. Our role in Relationship Scotland is to be impartial. We try to support the resident parent and the non-resident parent. 
very often the resident parent is uh, the mum, uh, but not always. It's roughly 10% of cases it would be the other way around. Um, so it's not always the case that the non-resident parent is the dad, but in many cases it is. Um, the safety and the welfare of children is Relationship Scotland's first priority. Uh, we clearly have referrals coming to us from a variety of places. Um, our role in particular is to make a risk assessment in each and every case as to whether or not uh, the, it is safe for that contact to go ahead. Uh, what I can say is, to the best of my knowledge, no child in the 25 years that we've been running child contact centres has ever been physically harmed by a parent, uh, by one, by a parent in our child contact centres. Um, we run our centres very safely uh, and very carefully, and uh, people are appropriately trained. Uh, and whilst there's clearly a debate to be had about when it's right for contact to go ahead or not, when contact does go ahead in our centres, we do it in a safe, in a safe manner for all concerned. Okay, thanks. Can I ask you about this? I think the suggestion that you're making is that because the formal agencies are under pressure. Yeah. There are young, there are families come to you now that wouldn't have come to you in the past. That would have had a more, um, a kind of more formal, um, supervised system. Does that mean that there are young people and families coming to you that basically it's inappropriate for them to come to you? There's always a judgment to be made about the, the appropriateness of whether someone is coming to us. What we do know is people are coming to us. For example, as I, as I mentioned, if you take drug and alcohol issues as a as a starting point, uh, where you would have hoped that there would be support in place for those types of issues that they're facing already. Uh, and we're finding that those supports aren't in place. Uh, and there's additional complexities to the, the, the contact arrangements that are, that are happening. Mm -hmm. But you've, you've got absolute authority to say that's not an appropriate case to come to us. We do. Whilst the courts can refer cases to Relationship Scotland, we make an independent judgment okay. about whether or not we consider it safe for that contact to go ahead. Now, we wouldn't try to replicate the decision or re revisit the decision of the court about whether contact should happen with the judgment we would make is, is this particular contact safe to happen in our child contact centres? Uh, and if it's not, we don't go ahead with it. And now I think it'd be fair to say there's not a massive number of cases that we wouldn't go ahead with um, in terms of making the, the judgment on it. But uh, on a regular basis, we do not take referrals from the court um, to because in our judgment it wouldn't be right and wouldn't be safe for that contact to go ahead. Okay, Ian Maxwell. Um, from our experience with families and fathers, we come across a lot of fathers who are asked to use the contact centre as part of an interim order um, done by the court. One of the things that's happening here is that when the court has a child welfare hearing, it doesn't have a lot of firm evidence in front of it but the court is keen to maintain the contact between the parent and the child. And so a number of the referrals by court to contact centres are not because of any of the issues that Stuart has mentioned, the drug, alcohol, domestic violence. They're simply because the court doesn't know the full situation. They haven't had a specialist report, but they want to maintain the, keep the contact running. And we often get asked by fathers, I've been living with my children for a long time. Since I left the home, I haven't seen them. I've gone to court, and the court has said, you've got to see them in a contact centre. We say to them, do it, because it's a chance to resume the contact with your children. It also gives safety for both parents and the child, because there will be trained people there who will observe what's happening, avoid some of the conflicts which often happen at handovers handovers between um, separated parents when there's a high degree of tension uh, can be difficult points, but the contact centre can avoid this by having a handover, you know, with sep you know, the children are handed over in the contact centre and the parents don't actually meet themselves. And so part of the role of contact centres is purely for um, the, to allow the court to make a safe decision, but use the supervised contact as a means of ensuring that, that there are no risks. Um, there obviously are many where the court is concerned about domestic violence or drug or alcohol, and, and, and that's a separate issue. But, uh, but just that the, to give a, a, a full picture of, of the, the type of people using contact centres, it's a very wide range. It can be almost anybody if, if they're going to court and the court doesn't have firm evidence but wants to make a decision of contact. Okay, Marcia Scott. Um, yes, just a, a couple of things um, I think 
that I would hope would help frame the conversation today, especially in response to the specific circumstances around the petitioner's um, case, which is I think it's really unhelpful to talk about contact as a generic event. Um, it's unhelpful to talk about relationship breakdown as if it's domestic abuse. Um, and that what we really hear, I think, are focusing on is something that's been flagged up by Scottish Women's Aid for at least 10 years, um, joint work with the Children's Commission on it over the last three years, um, which is contact in the context of domestic abuse. And the use of contact centers um, out with that is, a I think, a very different discussion. Uh, and I think in this case, the getting engaged in a, a, a pro and con about the, um, contact ordered out with domestic abuse is not terribly helpful because it's, it really is a separate event. Um, and, and the notion of impartiality is a misnomer in the context of domestic abuse unless we completely ignore the, the rights of children in the context of harm. So I, I guess I would encourage us all to, to be thinking about this as not you know, contact generically, but as contact in the context of domestic abuse. We have libraries of evidence that that does, can, can and does do harm to children when it's not um, managed appropriately, and sometimes it can't be managed appropriately and safely. Um, often for both mother and child. We've had academic research in Scotland and the UK for since the 1990s that the orders of co that contact orders were putting women and children in, in danger, in real danger. I mean, I'm I'm not minimizing. I do not wish to minimize it, but also every day in Scotland that children were being harmed, not by ill-intentioned people in any part of the system except possibly abusers, but. Um, I think it's really, really, if we're going to do something about this problem, we have to be really clear about what it is. And it is about the presumption in the system to award contact um, when it is unclear that that is safe. And I think um, it would be, we would so welcome the petitions committee's help around getting some traction for this very specific discussion. Because um, we, you know we've been talking about it now for 10 years. Vari will tell you that, you know, Emma's story, as horrific as it is, um, it is replicated in our caseloads every week. And um, the stories are, you know, you know, we, we have had very little traction in the system. And we would really ask that instead of engaging in sort of academic conversations about contact in general, we look at what can urgently be done. And we do have a, a few suggestions for that. I don't know if this is the time for that, and I'm willing we'll we'll to hold off on that. Uh -huh. But it is really important, I think, here to, to be focusing on um, the rights of the child in the context of domestic abuse. OK. Can I take Vardy McGowan, and then I'll come back to you? I would agree that there are two totally different situations where you've got contact in general, where relationships have broken down, and contact where there's been um, domestic abuse. It's two totally, totally separate things. And what I want to do is highlight the situation of clients of ours that have experienced really dreadful experiences um, throughout the, their, the, the separation um, and ongoing management of all of this. Not all, I want to highlight here, though, stress here, that not all contact centres are run by Relationship Scotland. The issue is anybody can set up and act as a contact centre. Just set up, a, I know, you know, set up a website, send out mailings to courts, um, tell people what they're supplying, and that's them a contact centre. We've got no way of regulation. 90%, following what Stuart said, 90% um, is supported contact. And there is no idea then whether the um, non-resident parent is questioning the child or not. And I have to say, I, in fact, I was um, contacted this morning on the way here by someone who said that the contact centre, which is not one of Relationship Scotland, had refused to allow her someone to accompany her to the centre, which an action that she had taken um, in order to feel safe um, going in and out. So there are all sorts of decisions um, and 
issues that are arising. Um, but the main point is, I think, that we need to make sure that children are safe um, and are not put under pressure by non-resident parents about what the resident parent has been doing, who they've been seeing. We want to make sure that risk assessments take place. And really, we need a, we need a, a real shake-up of the system. Um, so, you know, like Marsha, let's look for solutions, um, but let's separate out um, the situation of contact centres, which do a really valuable job where there's not domestic abuse, but where there is domestic abuse in complex situations, we need a radical change. Can I just say that in terms of the individual petition, just to be careful about um, anything we might say about the individual circumstances of the petitioner, but the general points have come from her petitioner really, really um, have given us an important focus, and I absolutely hear, I think, a lot of the evidence we've had being given is specifically about the issue around where there is domestic abuse, but I think we're also interested in getting a picture of how contact centres work and how, mm. you know, there's a general issue around security within um, contact centres and then having particular um, process for dealing where there is dom domestic abuse and whether, in fact, it's appropriate at all in those cases mm. um, for the, the kind of provision that you're giving, but you wanted to come in? Yeah, just to briefly to, to support and agree with Marsha and Vary, I think the importance of focusing this discussion around the particular issue of domestic abuse and contact is vital. Um, Relationship Scotland works, uh, and we've had many conferences and presentations alongside Scottish Women's Aid and others. Uh, one of the key developments we would like to see would be the development of specialist risk assessments that the court can order before uh, making a decision on contact. We think it's a, it's a significant gap in the process. They have started on a very small scale. There's been four uh, specialist risk assessments done by someone called Katrina Grant. Um, they have been well received by the sheriffs who've been involved in that. And we think it's an important gap. That there's a necessity, I believe, in these cases to have these specialist risk assessments. Uh, and I agree with Marsha saying that the conversation is best focused, of course, the other issues as well. But to have that focus um, on domestic abuse and contact, I think, is really important. Very briefly, in terms of the number of child contact centres in Scotland, 46 come under the banner of Relationship Scotland. And to our knowledge, there's three independent child contact centres uh, that currently aren't under uh, the banner of Relationship Scotland. But you think AMD could set one up? Well, you know, yes, you can. You know, the, 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 someone who contacted me has been in touch with me recently. Um, you know, there's, there's, what would stop them? Um, you know, there's nothing to stop anyone setting up a contact centre. Mm -hmm. um, and this particular individual has tried to find out details of um, the management of the centre, um, etc. And uh, it's been it's been very difficult. I checked it out as well. Um, I couldn't find easily mm -hmm. details. Um, so people are left in limbo, um, and there's not um, you know the, the t just to take it back slightly. When court reports, child welfare reports are, are written, they're written by people who may not have a knowledge and understanding of the dynamics and risk. Um, of domestic abuse anyway. So courts are put in the position of having to make decisions when they may not have appropriate reports in front of them. Not all sheriffs have training in domestic abuse. It is not mandatory. So there's, there's gaps in the system all the way through before it even gets to contact centres. And then when it does get there, the issue then is, how is it regulated? People think when they hear... Um, it will be in a contact centre. People immediately think it will be safe. But as Stuart points out, there's you know only 10% are supervised. And while I agree the supervised handover is very helpful, if there's not someone in the room and there's been domestic abuse, we don't know what's been said. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, Polly? Um, I just wanted to thank the petitioner for, for raising the issues that she has in her petition, because I think... Um, this is a significant children's rights issue, particularly the issue of children who are affected by domestic abuse and um, the issue of disputed contact. Um, in terms of some of the rights that it does engage, it engages the right for the child's best interests um, to be taken in account, into account when decisions are being made um, about them. It also takes into account Article 12 of the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child, which talks about the voice of the child in decisions that affect them. And I think there are some very significant issues here in terms of children facing barriers to being able to put across their views and, and barriers to them being believed. 
There are other um, rights that are engaged here as well, around the right for a child not to be separated from a parent unless it is in their best interest to do so. Um, and also the right for them to be protected from all forms of physical and mental violence. And I think in the time that I've been working at the Commissioner's Office, I've been there since 2005. Initially, I worked there um, and I ran their inquiry service and we received a number of calls from parents um, who were very distressed by the process of taking their child to contact. They were very distressed that their child did not appear to have a voice in the proceedings and when they were allowed the chance to say something, they generally were not believed or their views were discounted because it was felt that they were being manipulated by the, the resident parent. And I think there is a, a further issue for me as well around legal representation for these children. There were changes to um, the legal aid regulations back in 2010, 2011, and these made it much more difficult for children to have independent legal representation. And um, this was because they changed the eligibility criteria so that in, before what had happened was that children were able to um, be um, eligible on the basis of their own income and then they changed it so that it, parental income was taken into account as well. And what that's done, that small change has made it almost impossible for a child who's experiencing domestic abuse to be heard in those kind of settings. The settings um, that children are, are in are patently not child friendly. The forms that are used, the, the uh, methods that are used to take their views are not child friendly. This is a system that is built for adults which doesn't take into account the dynamics of domestic abuse as Fari and, and Marsha have said, but also don't take into account what it's like to be a child and the harm that domestic abuse can do to that child. I think that's really interesting. Just maybe ask you how appropriate do you think it is in terms of hearing a child's voice for them to instruct a solicitor? Would it not be more appropriate that there was a system in place where there was independent children's workers who knew how to work with young people and, and hear their voice through that rather than, you know, I mean, I have some experience there sitting in a hearing system mm -hmm. in a panel and there's lots of solicitors there representing, you know, everybody in the room virtually, but that, whether that actually means the, the child's voice is heard through that process, I'm not sure. I don't know what you think about that. I think, I think that's a fair point. I think that the problem at the moment is that um, what happens is that the child's views are generally thought to be um, represented through the pursuer so solicitor, so the mother solicitor, so there's automatically there some suggestion that the child's views are being manipulated or changed in some way. In an ideal world, yes, having someone there who could um, work with a child, who could build up a relationship with the child and allow them to speak openly, then that would absolutely be mm. helpful. I think um, one of the issues that came out of some research that we carried out as an office in 2013 was that when um, court reporters spoke to children, they often were um, not taking the time to get to know the child and the child was balancing up all sorts of risks. A child that's in a domestic abuse situation is having to think about, if I say this, will it get back to, in most cases, my father? If I get back to, if I say this, will there be retaliation on my mother because of what I've said? They're balancing up a whole more, a whole wider range of issues than a child in a general kind of contact situation where they're perhaps worried about hurting the other parent's feelings. This is much more about a safety issue. Mm -hmm. I think we, we did get some um, information from, I think, I can't remember the title of the, the worker, but it was a children's worker, and that seemed to me to be somebody who would actually be able to have those kind of conversations that you're allowed to say. You know, that whole thing about children going into circumstances mm -hmm. where they're not even allowed to say whether they enjoyed themselves or not, because it might have consequences on either parent. But, um, Ian, you want to come in? Can I pick up on two of the points that have just been made? Um, firstly, on this question of training of child welfare reporters, who are the people who are now tasked with preparing reports for court. There was a, um, um, a working group established a few years ago, included ourselves and Scottish Women's Aid and various other organisations, uh, who prepared a series of recommendations on how this system could be improved. Some of them have, have been implemented, the ones to do with the, how the interlocutors are prepared and so on. But one of the crucial recommendations of that working group, which was to that, that child welfare reporters should, be, should, should have to take training in various things. And obviously the key aspects here was training in domestic abuse and training in parental alienation. Now, these, this was agreed by that working group. It was, a, I think, across, across, right across the board. But so far, this 
recommendation has not been implemented and uh, we've been advised that there is some problem in, in, in making, insisting that these things happen, but we feel that it's ridiculous that child welfare reporters shouldn't be expected to undertake that sort of crucial training. So that's one thing, and I hope that's a point that the, this committee could maybe take up on. The second point um, is about the views of children. Um, I'm also a member of the Family Law Committee of the Scottish Civil Justice Council, though obviously I state I'm not, I'm not speaking on their behalf in this forum. I'm speaking purely from my Families Need Fathers in, uh, involvement. That committee has been actively involved in looking at the ways that the views of children are taken. It has been engaging with a, a whole range of other organisations and also commissioned uh, some consultation with children and young people about how their views should be given to court. The form that children use, which at the moment is a really dry, nasty-looking form F9, which is not child-friendly in any form, is, is being revised at the moment it's being redesigned, and I hope that the new form will help. But I think that Family Law Committee is actively still pursuing this issue because they recognise that there is a need for better methods to ensure that children's views are taken into account and, and in an appropriate way. Also, the issue about confidentiality confidentiality of children's views if they're taken in a court setting is, is, is a really important issue. But you know, I pointed that out, that this work is, is taking place um, in, in, in this area, but I'm sure the committee would be glad to maybe sort of um, you know, reiterate the importance of children's views. Um, and just finally, on children's views, it's very important that children have an input into this process, but children shouldn't be the decision makers. Um, the views of children are very important, but it's the court and the, 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 who are the, the ultimate body who are making the decisions, and I think that, that's also important. Okay, uh, Marcia Scott, and Paul. Sure. Um, I, think, uh, um, I think the committee may have heard from um, uh, the Children's Rights Officer in West Lothian, um, and I happen to know about that because I started the post when I was working there, and um, just... Uh, we, d we did it um, in the context of desperation, really, not being able to find a way to get the, the, the um, concerns of children into the, into the evidence in front of the courts. I agree with Ian around that. Um, and also uh, to be actually listened to and, and to influence, not, not, you know, that children's decisions, you know, wishes were the decider completely, but that they absolutely there was no evidence that they were influencing the process in any way. And, um, it, what, and what we were then finding were traumatized children and mothers coming through our domestic and sexual assault service. Um, with, and our, we had no way to really support the, the, the um, ending of that trauma. So, um, and, and what we found was when you had somebody with training exactly like Pauline says, around children's development and how you talk to children. And she, she now has a caseload of 200 and something in West Lothian, which is not the hugest local authority in Scotland. Um, uh, and, and what she found, I think, and we found, was that uh, a, a, it doesn't take a, a rocket science and it doesn't take a huge amount of time, but it takes somebody who understands how to work with children and understands the nature of domestic abuse. And she worked with children when I was there as, lo as young as four years old and was able to help them draw pictures, to, you know, write letters, do the kinds of ways that were communication that was um, most effective for them um, and share that with sheriffs. And I know that there's some sheriffs now in West Lothian who almost automatically default to getting her involved with cases like this. And I think this comes directly to your question about are lawyers the, the most appropriate now. I would completely support that under CRC and, and other obligations, children have a right to, to access to justice just like adults do, and they should be able to have legal representation. It's not an either or, but the preferred model would be that there were trained, appropriately trained people in communities, whether it's child's rights officers or how, how it um, uh, is uh, implemented, that have the appropriate ability to work with children and to feed their, their voices into the system. And I know the F9 form has been, is being revised and, 
um, a piece of work that, that uh, the Children's Commission and Scottish Women's Aid has been doing together on um, Power Up, Power Down, which we sent the links mm -hmm. for. So I yep. hope people get an opportunity because that's directly children's voices um, about their experiences of contact. Um, uh, has fed in to the, to the review of F9 and I hope that that will have um, some significant impact. But I think the, the, the theme, the thread that runs through a, a lot of what has been said by an, all of us, I think, so far, is, is the, um, the lack of appropriate training in the system. And what I call domestic abuse competence is sadly missing in many of the actors who make decisions about children's lives and women's lives um, in the context of domestic abuse. And, and um, I, I think um, we've when the appropriate training has been put in place in child welfare hearings, um, uh, we have seen some really good outcomes. So it's a bit about giving people, well-intentioned people who are trying to make the interests of children paramount in their discussions, um, the tools to understand what's actually going on. Uh, I think um, one of the things that we have been calling for for some time now is a, a requirement that any sheriff that hears a case that involves domestic abuse have specialist training, which is not the case. But also, social workers do not have to be trained at the moment in, in um, uh, domestic abuse, and we hear very often from uh, cases around, and we have 36 services and all across Scotland, so this really is, and every single one of them tells us this is a problem, that um, social workers sometimes say to them, this is a court problem, this isn't a, you know, this isn't in our case loan. Okay, Polly and then Mary. Yeah, I just wanted to pick up on something that Ian had said in terms of the Scottish Civil Justice Council. I absolutely agree that the Scottish Civil Justice Council are working very hard to try and improve um, the situation for children and young people that are going through these types of proceedings. And indeed, ourselves and Scottish Women's Aid have had a lot of dialogue um, with them to, to try and inform that. I know they're revising the F9 form, but we're equally aware that a form is not the way forward for children and young people and that children require a, a whole range of ways to allow them to contribute in a way that works for them. Um, the work that Marsha alluded to is the Power Up, Power Down project, which we worked in partnership with Scottish Women's Aid on, and that involved consulting with 27 um, children, I think aged between 7 and 15. Um, and the idea behind it was quite an innovative way of, of looking at it. So a cartoon was produced which explored how children's views are sought at present in these types of cases. And the children were asked to look at the cartoon to talk about um, how it made them feel and then to try and create a new cartoon which set out in an ideal world how that would work differently. And I think there were some really useful suggestions as part of that. So if you do have the opportunity to, to, to look at that report, hopefully, and some videos that we've produced as well that explain um, some of the children's views on that. Um, I, I suppose just to give you a very basic example as well, I was made aware of a, of a case once where um, a child experiencing domestic abuse was trying to provide their view and they asked to do, through, do it through the medium of Lego. They wanted to use Lego to help explain, um, which is a very sort of child-friendly way of doing it. And they were told no, <laughs> they weren't allowed to do it. Um, and I think that to me demonstrates probably clearer than almost anything else. The way that the system is set up at the moment is process-driven and it's about we need to do things this way, we need to do things that way, instead of being child-centred. And that's what we need, a child-centred system that understands the dynamics of domestic abuse and the particular impact and the harm that domestic abuse causes to children and young people. OK, Mary? Our service covers 42% of Scotland's population. And daily, our children's workers talk to children um, about child contact. Children raise it all the time. Um, asking about will they be forced to go, what will happen, um, their worries about being asked questions. Um, we have report writers coming to the office, asking, you know, interviewing our workers, asking them for um, details. Um, and it's not unusual that at the end of that situation, a report writer will say, I never thought about this, or I, I never, I, my goodness, I never understood all that was going on. 
Um, and when we're doing that, we're not talking in, you know, we're talking in general about the situation around domestic abuse. There's a dearth um, of information out there. And yet, there's so many things that would help. Adopting David Mandel's safe and together approach, which we've all been talking about for a number of years now, would make such a difference. Because what it does is focus on what is the, what is the, the what are the, What's happening in terms of the abusive behaviour? How is it impacting in the child? What are the mitigating circumstances that the other parent is putting in place? And what's the effect on the child? The whole system is there to ensure that children are safe and together with all parents. And we could ensure there's a number of local authorities that have started that process in Scotland. And really what we need to do is, is try and push that forward and make sure that children are at the centre. Because unless we ensure children are at the centre, children will not be safe. Okay, thanks for that. Can I just maybe ask something? I'm going to take Rona in in a, in a minute around some of the training issues, but um, I had got the opportunity to go and uh, visit one of your centres in, in Glasgow, and we'd want to put on record my thanks to them for what was a very interesting visit. One of the issues that has been raised through the petition is the idea that the non-resident parent has, a, has entitlement to contact, and the child is taken along, and whether they want to be there or not, they've got their time. Now, what I was told was that, that wouldn't happen, that a child wouldn't be obliged to be in, you know, there, there wouldn't be a pressure on a child to stay if the child was distressed or unhappy. Can you maybe say something about that? But that in circumstances where a child is coming for supported um, contact and they don't want to be there, but the father saying, well, wait a minute, I've got two hours. What is, what is the advice to the, the, the centre staff in those circumstances? Yeah, it's a, very, it's a very good point you raise. I mean, in terms of, say, a child who was, if it was a court-ordered contact that was sent to, came to one of our centres, if the child was distressed, fundamentally did not want to go through, um, our staff would not progress with that contact. If the child uh, was saying that they did not want to go uh, through uh, and that was their settled position, um, they would not go through. Our staff may gently encourage people to go through, but nothing beyond that. Nothing beyond that. I think that's really key. Is that there's, there's not situations where children are being physically forced to go through for contact. That would not happen in our child contact centres. So it's not your obligation to enforce the court order? It's not. It's not. Uh, uh, the, the court can order contact to take place. Relationships aren't being ordered by the court to make it happen. Um, as I've said previously, we do, uh, on a number of occasions, we'll just make the decision that we don't believe it's safe for that contact to happen in our centres and we will not facilitate it. We'll say it's not happening. Um, and if on the day children fundamentally do not want to go through and to see their non-resident parent, then our staff will say the child was distressed and didn't want to go through and the contact didn't happen. It's and not our job to enforce contact to happen, it's to facilitate it where it's appropriate and safe to do so. And do you keep an eye in the sense if a child becomes distressed or is unhappy or uncomfortable, there's means by which they can come back out of the contact? Absolutely, if that was the circumstance, we would bring the, the contact to, to an end. Can I bring in Rona? Yes, sure. Uh -huh. yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think what we're hearing and what we pretty much knew was that the core of it uh, does rest in training, particularly for the, the the court system. Unfortunately, there's nobody here from the judiciary to, to speak today, which is unfortunate. Um, but I wanted to ask you about... Um, you, you said earlier that the, you understood that the, court, the judges were quite uh, amenable to the specialist court training. And, is that something that you think is widespread? Do you think this is...? I think there's two issues. There's the training for the child welfare reporters to make sure that they're adequately trained in terms of domestic abuse issues and, and skilled in terms of how to take the views of, ch of children. But in addition to that, there's a need for new specialist risk assessments around domestic abuse. I think, for, for certainly for Relationship Scotland's point of view, that's a major gap in the system. Mm -hmm. So that's not just about the training of the child welfare reporters. It's about having highly trained new people available to the court who can undertake specialist risk assessments uh, where domestic abuse is a concern and I think that would be would make a radical difference to the quality of the decision making of the courts. It is in nobody's interest for dangerous, violent, coercively controlling men to be continuing to, to in some ways harm the lives of women and children beyond and the courts I think would need to be equipped 
to make sure they're making the best decisions possible. Uh, and one of the routes we've been advocating for many years has been the development of new specialist risk assessments. They started on a very small scale. We had, uh, as an organisation, applied a number of years ago to try to set up a pilot project. Unfortunately, we couldn't get that funding. Um, but in our opinion, that would make a significant uh, step forward in terms of the quality and decision making of the courts if they would have new specialist risk assessments around domestic abuse. Ultimately, it's the judge that will order contact. Yep. So we've heard that there are problems with judges knowing enough about the case, the background information to it and, and coming fresh to it and not really there's been a breakdown in communication. So while well, I hear what you're saying about the specialist, uh, other yep. members of staff, ultimately yep. the judges and the judiciary, judiciary themselves have to have some awareness of what the background to the case has been. We would certainly support Minister Relationship Scotland ourselves. We've been involved in the training of sheriffs through the Judicial Committee um, uh, and clearly we would support additional training for sheriffs around the areas of domestic abuse. I think that would be, important. That would be very important. Yeah. Yeah. Just sorry, just, just while I'm on that, can I ask you about the training for your staff and volunteers in Relationship Scotland's yeah. centres? Because we've heard, well, we have a briefing to say that they go and undergo full training, yeah. but we've heard that that isn't always the case. Can you tell me how much training they go through? Well, all, all staff, all depends. partly depends on the role that they would play. Um, so there would be a difference in training, for example, for those staff and volunteers who undertake supported uh, contact versus those who do supervised contact. There would be a higher level of training for those who undertake supervised contact because of the writing of reports of the court and the, mm -hmm. the kind of analysis of the quality of the contact. Um, but our, basic training that all volunteers and staff would go through would cover the key issues around child protection, domestic abuse and uh, other areas. Now, I think it would be fair to say there's been a development over the 25 years that we've been doing child contact centres in terms of improving standards and quality as we go. And that is a journey that continues. Um, could our training be better than it is? I think it could be. Um, I think there's, there's uh, challenges there for us to, to address to try to make sure that is an ongoing improvement of the standards that we have. Um, but uh, no one would go into working out our child contact centres without previous experience of working with children and without going through all of the training that we have in place so, just so, now. So how long does that training, what, what is the training, how long does it take place, what's the time scale of it? Um, it would be, in terms of, uh, kind of, basically it would be a number of days, we're not talking about a, a, a social work course for a, a number of years, mm -hmm. they would receive basic training covering a number of issues over uh, about two days or so. Two days? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm going to take in Mary, Marsha, I think Ian, you're indicating to come in, and I'd be interested in your views on this question of training for the judiciary and training for uh, the centres. I mean, maybe I could ask you, you, you talked about if a child were distressed, is there a definition of what that, how that would just reveal itself to us members? And that's part of the skill, I mean, I believe the, the visit you, you had to Glasgow the other day, you were speaking with a, a, a Carol, who runs our child contact centres in Glasgow, and, and Brian McGlynn. Um, the people who work there are highly experienced yeah. in terms of working with children uh, and knowing the issues that they're facing and being incredibly sensitive around to how difficult a process this can be at times for children. Um, and as I say, the first priority, the first top priority for everyone involved in our work at Relationship Scotland is for the safety and the welfare of children. Um, there is, and just to come back to your, your point, Rona, that you raised, it's not our job to enforce contact to happen, it's to facilitate it where it's safe and appropriate to do so. Uh, and our staff would not uh, wish to see uh, children being distressed and going to contact that they fundamentally don't want to do. And if they don't want to go through after perhaps a couple of times of saying, would you like to go through? If they don't want to go through, the, that will be the end of the contact and the contact won't have taken place. Okay, Mary? I think in terms of the training, first of all, the judiciary have a day's course on domestic abuse, which is excellent. But the problem is they have to volunteer to go on it. And it's not at the moment, as far as I'm aware, regularly being run. How that might not be the case, but you de it's you know, there's there's a at the last time I spoke to um, the Judicial Studies Committee, which was at the end of the year, it had been a significant period of time since that course had run. The, in terms of the report writers, n there is no mandatory training for any report writers in court about domestic abuse at all. So there's a vast, there's a, a huge range of experience from woefully inadequate to very good. 
But I want to ask you to think about this issue through the eyes of a child, where a child has been... It's regular experiences for us that our children are incredibly upset. They don't want to go. They've had nightmares. They've been bedwetting. They've been crying, saying to mothers, I don't want to go. And mum's having to say, the court's telling me that you have to go. And mum is having to say, or the child is saying to mum, why are you making me do this? So the child is then dragged to the, the contact centre to meet someone that they don't know, saying, would you like to go through and see dad? Now, how on earth is that child going to feel able to say to a stranger, you know what, I, don't, I, I really don't want to go? We're asking children to stand up against this, a system that is not child-centric. And I just don't think it's, it's feasible to, to expect children to say that. And I, I wholeheartedly agree with Stuart around risk assessment and the, the Katrina Grant's reports. I'm, I'm right with you on that. But in terms of you know, gentle encouragement, what we may perceive as adults to be gentle encouragement and what a child may perceive as something else, I think could be, could be different. Um, also, um, the, you know, one, we're asking children once or twice. You know, it's... That, that, I think, is undue pressure. I also think that in terms of training for centre staff, it needs to be longer than a couple of days. I would be saying that for domestic abuse alone, it needs to be three days to look at in detail the coercive control, the dynamics, the, the effect on adult victims, the effect on children, um, looking at... You know, so there's a... Having small periods of look out... For, you know, usually... Gen generic training in domestic abuse will pick up people at the extreme end of the abusive um, spectrum. Um, what it won't do is pick up the subtle manipulation um, that will go on. And abusers can, you know, are, are of all sorts. You can't, if it was easy to spot them, then we wouldn't have a situation, a, a problem of domestic abuse in our society, because we'd see them. But that's not how they appear. They appear, um, and for the most part, as genuine, authentic human beings, when in fact they've got a high level of expertise at manipulating their victims and manipulating society. Can I think, can you say to me, if you have come across any examples of women ending up in the court system because they've been deemed not to be ensuring that contact takes place? Absolutely. Women have been held in contempt. Women have been jailed. Um, there was a, quite a famous case recently where a woman was held, I think, for three days. Um, so, yes, women are told that So what that do you put that down to? Is that the court system? Um, I think that, it, yes, yes. Um, people not understanding and not being believed. Judges assume, sheriffs assume that when women say there's been domestic abuse that they're lying. What happens is you're told by your lawyer, please don't mention domestic abuse because it'll look as though you're trying to influence the outcome of the court. So she sits there not mentioning domestic abuse. The, the hearing goes on, her anxiety rises, and then as it looks as if contact's about to take place, then she'll blurt out, but there's domestic abuse. And of course the court then goes, hmm, you're raising that now at the end of the, the process, but lawyers have been saying all the way through, sheriffs won't like it, don't raise it too early. So there's an issue about training for solicitors, for sheriffs, Absolutely. the court system. Um, Marsha and then you. Yeah. Um, I'd like to pick up on a couple of things. Um, one is that I am absolutely sure that there is fabulous practice happening in some of the child contact centres, but I have to challenge our experience over many years and speaking to thousands of women and children is that children are forced into unwanted contact every day in Scotland, um, much of which happens in contact centers, not because people are ill-intentioned, but because of a, of a system that forces children all the way through. Um, and when they hit contact centers, they're there as a result of the system, not because of the contact centers. Um, I can tell you one case I remember um, when I was working in West Lothian about a child who was reluctant, who was um, in a contact center somewhere, and I don't know where it was, um, who the, the worker there told the child that there were sweeties and toys in the other room in order to get them to go in because the child was reluctant. One case where the child was told that the child's mother was in the room, and in fact, it was not the child's mother, it was the child's father. I mean, th I, I, these sound like 
isolated cases. They're rep they're, they are repeated over and over in Scotland every day. And I, and I have to say the system is failing children and, and what, what it's, it's not doing what it says on the tin. The contact centers aren't doing what they say on the tin. The, the, you know, the protection of children and their interests as the paramount consideration happens almost never. And I think you know, we, we have to start listening to these, to these voices. In terms of the court ordered um, uh, problems with, with women being put in jail um, uh, around, usually around contempt proceedings, um, we have women tell us all the time that they are really afraid to tell the truth about what their children are telling them because they're afraid they will be sanctioned and seen as um, uh, taking the court um, uh, in contempt. Uh, th there is no way through the system that women can be guaranteed that people who hear their cases will not assume that they're lying, despite the fact that there is next to no evidence in the literature that says that women consistently lie about domestic abuse and th its impact on their children. Um, in terms of training, I absolutely agree about the Judicial Studies Institute course. Um, and I think we do have some good practice to look back at, which is when we set up the Glasgow S Specialist Domestic Abuse Court, very early in its, in its history, all of the, the sheriffs who heard cases got specialist training. And the outcomes of those cases were so much better than the routine, everyday cases that are being heard these days. Um, and while you know the sheriffs have been telling us for ten years, you you know we're independent. You can't force us to have training. Um, and I would never try to force a sheriff to do anything. Trust me. Um, I, I think it is. It is possible for us to do what we did initially in Glasgow, which is to say, absolutely, we can't force you to have training. But we can say, if you're going to hear a domestic abuse case, you have to have training. If you're going to hear a case that involves the rights and, and needs of children, you need to have training about children. Um, and it's not just judges. We have a whole host of legal aid lawyers who don't understand domestic abuse, who with great intent take up cases. And then we wind up um, uh, hearing stories about women who are now so into the system, they, they and their children have been so harmed by it. Um, and it is really hard for them to find a way back out because of the, the way the court system operates. Finally, wh one um, thing that I think has been, um, that we've been talking about for a long time is the systemic problem with the, the divide between criminal and civil courts systems and the way they operate in Scotland. And I know I sit on the justice experts group for the equally safe implementation and, and um, really happy to see a lot of concern across the, across the um, stakeholders on that group about this problem. But this problem has been looked at in other places and there are solutions. For instance, I think in New York, I talk like that, um, uh, they, they have a case in the context of domestic violence there of one case, one judge. You know, so because what we have in Scotland all the time that happens now is you'll have a criminal case in which um, uh, you know a, a perpetrators convicted of domestic abuse harm to both um, uh, non-offending parent and children identified and of concern to the case. That same child winds up in a court room, a, a room and maybe in the very same court, not very long after that, in which the discussion has almost nothing to do with with what has happened in that criminal case, or nothing actually in some cases. Um, and uh, the discussion is only about how contact can be facilitated in the context of relationship breakdown. So there's training needed all the way throughout the process. And I think as a system, we need to take responsibility for who, in whose hands are we putting children's interests. Okay, I'm gonna take Ian, Pauline, and then Angus, so maybe bring you in. Okay, we don't have the judiciary with us this morning, but I'm going to speak up on their behalf, particularly for the specialist family courts in Edinburgh and Glasgow. You have sheriffs there who've got extensive experience of family cases and who are doing a very difficult job because we've got to remember that sheriffs are having to determine whether or not an allegation of domestic abuse is an actual, uh, um, something that has actually happened. There are instances of 
allegations being made in order to gain uh, um, an advantageous place in uh, a contact dispute. And the, sh the court has this job of sorting out when is domestic abuse actually happening and when is it being alleged in order to give one parent the upper hand. Now, that is a difficult job. And I, we know of plenty of cases where the courts do order restrictions or complete cessation of contact. So it's not, it's not a case that there is an assumption that children should be seeing their parents. There's also, as the SPICE report pointed out um, in, in their submission, there is nothing in law that assumes that children should see their parents. It's very much the, 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 the emphasis is on the paramount importance of, of the, the welfare of children. So sheriffs in, and judges in our Scottish courts have got to do a very difficult job um, an English judge once described it one, now that capital punishment has finished. Family cases are amongst the most difficult ones facing sheriffs. Um, the, there is training. We've, we, we agree that more training should be available, but we feel that training should cover a range of issues, not just domestic abuse. It should also cover the, mean, the proper means of ascertaining the views of children. It should also cover the areas where children are being unduly influenced by one parent to reject the other. This is what's called parental alienation, and that's something which is becoming increasingly apparent both in the UK and in other parts of the world. And it is another factor that needs to be taken into account alongside domestic abuse. They're, they're, they're very difficult things to work on. Um, Avenue in Aberdeen, one of the services that uh, Relationship Scotland undertakes, has been doing a lot of work with children, commissioned by courts, talking to children, finding out their views. And one of the, the things that they say is that it's really vital that you talk to children several times, because the first time you talk to a child, you'll tend to hear things being echoed that they, they feel that they're supposed to say, either because they're, they're, their resident parent says it or whatever. You've then got to build up confidence in that child, and the child has got to be get to a stage where they are going to be willing to give more of their own views rather than the, the views that they feel they should be giving. So I think work of um, services like Avenue should definitely be supported and encouraged in other parts of Scotland. Um, and the, 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 so the, but you know, let's not let's not just let's the judges need to be held to account. But I don't think we should be viewing them as being the, 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 the culprits in this, in this system. I think the judges are working very hard to establish what it make what are very difficult decisions. Uh, they're often, over, in our view, overcautious when they're awarding contact. And coming back to the, the main focus of this meeting, which is the contact centres, contact centres provide a very valuable resource <coughs> within the, the system. Unfortunately, they are part of the voluntary sector, so they don't get guaranteed funding every year. They've often got to go out and raise money themselves to keep things going. And I feel that, if anything, that, that this committee should be supporting increased and, and secure funding for contact centres so that they can build up on their training, was mentioned here, so that they can recruit more people and so that they can provide more of their services. Okay, thanks. Can I just ask you about one of the things that we suggested to us is that a court would, con would look at a circumstance around contact where the, 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 the abuse was against usually the mother. Mm -hmm. But that would be deemed to be a separate decision or not a decision that would then impact on decision to have contact. I think they're what you're talking I, I mean, about. I'm working the assumption that what they think is, well, they're not abusing the child, so there should be contact. I mean, is that your experience? Well, there is mention in the 2006 Act about whether the child is present when, when, when abuse takes place. Um, and the, I was involved with, a, with um, an inner house appeal a couple of years ago where it was judged that, that because the dispute between the parents, which was a two-way dispute, it wasn't just a one-way domestic abuse thing, it was, it was, they were both, both of them were, uh, was not relevant to the um, uh, you know, the, um, in the lower courts, the, 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 the father's contact had been stopped, but the inner house appeal reinstated his contact because it was felt that this was more important to the child that the child should have um, contact with both parents. So it, it, each situation is going to be difficult, uh, complicated. The, the, the judges have got a very difficult job to do, and I would say that with you know, there are some very good examples of judges taking very 
um, difficult decisions um, and, and, and taking these factors into account. Okay, thanks. Pauline, and then Anne Gaspar, I'll let you come in maybe just briefly on the funding thing after Pauline. Yeah, just okay. very briefly, um, the Scottish Government does support the work of Relationship Scotland. Uh, last year, only £166,000 of that money was used uh, for our child contact centres. Um, given we run 46 centres, you'll appreciate that funding does not go very far. We do also have additional funding from the big lottery and other, other charitable trusts. But clearly, if there's to be a step change improvement in, say, the facilities, training, etc., that would need to be appropriately resourced. Okay, thanks. Pauline then, Angus. Um, I think the first thing for me is to, to say that um, I think we do children a great disservice <coughs> if we suggest that they essentially parrot back what their parents say to them. I think children, even very young children who are often not asked for their views, have very strong views about what it's like to live in an atmosphere where the domestic abuse is present. Um, you raised the point there, Ian, about a child witnessing incidents of domestic abuse. And I think there's been a lot of work that's been done around the domestic abuse bill um, at the moment to, to kind of demonstrate the fact that children are victims in their own right. Whether or not they witness something, living in that kind of toxic environment is harmful to them. Um, domestic abuse is recognised as being an adverse childhood event um, and I think to come back to something earlier on about a child having to go into a situation where they're distressed, um, I think there's a risk that we actually perpetuate that trauma and perpetuate that distress by the expectation being that a, a, a mother usually will facilitate that contact and will take a child who is incredibly distressed, who may have missed education because they have... Um, been wet in the bed and been very upset and had stomach aches, who may find that their mental health is under risk because of that. But asking a parent to take a child to a situation where the child may be clinging to the parent's leg and hand them over to someone that they don't know. I can't imagine any other situation in which that would be something that would be seen as being acceptable from a parenting point of view and from a child's perspective as well. Um, and I'm not suggesting that it's the contact centres that are forcing the children to um, have that contact. I'm absolutely not suggesting that. But I'm saying what I'm saying is that there's an expectation and there are risks to the mother and to the child if they don't comply with that court order. So if they're seen to be non-compliant, they're seen to be difficult, then it can cause difficulties for them later in terms of contact. Um, so I think those are the kind of key things as well. I think um, there may well be some cases where um, domestic abuse is raised, but I think that, again, does a disservice in terms of the vast majority of domestic abuse cases won't result in a conviction. As has been recognised by the Domestic Abuse Bill, the vast majority of domestic abuse incidents are coercive control incidents that happen on a day-to-day -day basis. They are often very subtle, manipulative techniques that are used that create an atmosphere of fear. And for a parent that allows their child to live in that environment, and I'm talking about the parent that actually perpetuates and is the perpetrator of that domestic abuse, that is a parenting choice. And that has to impact on the relationship with their child. It already does in terms of the fact that they're allowing them to be exposed to that kind of atmosphere. It um, breaches their right to mental health and good health. It breaches their right to have a say in that situation. And it puts them in a state of fear and alarm. And I think any system that says that's okay, really isn't putting the best interests of the child at the centre. Okay, Angus. Okay, thanks, um, Convena. We, we've covered the, the issue of training, mm -hmm. um, both with the judiciary and contact centres, uh, quite extensively this morning. However, I'd, I'd be keen to know what systems are in place to ensure uh, the staff at contact centres are aware of any particular conditions that apply to each individual case. And also, I'd be keen to know uh, with regard to contact centres, if you believe there should be a minimum ratio of staff uh, to other attendees at the centre? Stuart? Uh, yes, happy to say, to say that. Um, in terms of information that comes from the court, uh, we at Relationship Scotland believe that it's not as good as it should be. Very often we get very little information from the court about the background of the case and we are left to have to try to get that information from the parents themselves during the intake process uh, and that again is another key failing I think of the process we are not getting just sufficient knowledge of the issues that are facing the families that are coming to us we are still able to 
as best we can make a decision about this, the safety of the actual contact taking place, um, but we're left in the dark about many of the issues about the families. So I think you raise uh, an excellent point there. Um, sorry, the second point was? Um, with regard to um, uh, minimum ratios of staff and also the, uh, um, the, the, the need to ensure that the uh, staff are aware of any particular conditions. Yes, um, in, in terms of uh, staff numbers for supervised contact, there would be two well-trained staff um, involved in supervised contact. In supported contact, staff would be around at some points to be inside the room, at some points outside. The supported contact cases would be ones where it's been viewed that contact is safe to go ahead. Um, uh, without further supervision. So there's been a judgment made, whether it's by the courts and indeed by ourselves, that supported contact is safe and appropriate to happen. Uh, and as I say, that's the vast majority of the cases, as we mentioned before, are straightforward. Um, so, you know, there's, there's that judgment made in each and every case about whether it's, it's safe to, to go ahead. Uh, in terms of sort of raw numbers, we try to have as, as uh, low numbers as possible, I guess, in the supported rooms. And of course, when it's supervised, there's only one case uh, in the room at any one time. Okay. Anyone else on that one? Can I just ask? It's, it may be an unfair question, but what sort of proportion or percentage of children do you see that are distressed when they come to your your centres? It's hard to say. I don't personally work in child contact centres. Um, in, in terms of uh, the managers who work in the centres. In the vast majority of the cases, there will be a level of nervousness about going ahead. What, we're, what we see in the vast majority of cases is once contact begins and establishes and they can get over that first hurdle, um, there's very good uh, contact and very good relations between children and, and their non-resident parent. Um, in terms of, say, what our clients tell us, 79% of our clients who go through the child contact centres say it's the process has made a significant improvement to the quality of their family life and to their family situation. Um, and, for, and for those who provide us feedback, 99% of our clients say that they would recommend our child contact centres to others. So whilst clearly some people do not have and have not had positive experience going through child contact, many, many people do. And we're seeing 2,000 uh, children each year plus th their parents, as 4,000 plus people each year are going through our child contact centres, uh, and they are telling us in the vast majority that they're having a very positive experience uh, and that the process is making a significant improvement to their lives. What proportion of the youngsters that come to you are coming from family? To take the point that uh, Marsha Scott makes about us focusing on domestic abuse, there could be a general thing that the contact centre works simply for this family breakdown I mean, we will all know folk who has been a breakdown, and it's astonishing, you know, you can have drop-offs where they don't go anywhere near the house and all that kind of stuff. So, uh, so you can see that. But what proportion of the young people who go to contact centres will have been identified to you as being in a, in a circumstance of domestic abuse? Well, certainly the majority of those that would come for supervised contact, clearly it's been, it's been raised as an issue and a concern there. Um, from the courts, I mean, as, as a broad indication that the majority, as I say, of the, of the child contact that go ahead uh, are more straightforward around the issues of relationship breakdown. But as, as a rough guide, a tenth of them, one in ten, comes through the supervised process. And there's a reason for why the courts have ordered that to be a highly supervised process. Uh, as, a, as a broad indication, that would be, that'd be roughly there. So, and, and do you track that 10% in a different way? So you would get the fact that the 90%, if they actually are able to establish contact and it works, but for the 10% where it's supervised, where there's ex issues of violence or domestic abuse or coercive control, do you track those specifically to see if there are, you know, and, and do you treat them? I mean, if you may just talk us through, yeah. mm -hmm. so you know that's the circumstance that the child is coming in and are there specific things that you do and the specific things you keep an eye out for? And do you record and report back on that? Uh, yes, would be the summary of that. The cases that come to us are supervised clearly are receiving far, far more intensive oversight in terms of the, the quality of the contact, in terms of writing back to the court. Um, we write factual accounts back to the court of the quality of contact, what actually happened in the contact. So things like, for example, if the child was distressed or for any reason the contact had to come to an end, the, the details of that are being reported back to the courts. There's a fundamental difference between supported and supervised contacts. So when the courts have these uh, understandable concerns, the whole process is very highly supervised. And as I say, all of 
the quality of that co of that contact is then fed back to the court through a court report. Okay, thanks. Fari, then Pauline, and then I'm going to ask um, if Morris and Edward have particular questions they want to ask, and then I think we'll just kind of try and pull it together. The vast majority of clients that we've worked with who have experienced this issue, supervised contact has not been the process by which they have experienced contact centres. So that for us, the vast majority of clients, it's supported contact. Um, so even you know, there's, there's, it seems to me that we're we're lacking in knowledge of exactly how many um, situations of domestic abuse. Um, there are, um, and when there are, we're, you know, there's all sorts of different assumptions being made at different parts of the process that mean there are gaps that we, you know, that we need to plug. And I absolutely take um, Stuart's point um, about funding and the difficulties when you're struggling with resources about what you would like to provide and what you're able to um, in terms of, of service or training or whatever. Um, but I think it's absolutely crucial that, if nothing else, we move forward in a way that hears that the, the gaps will be addressed. Because wherever there are gaps in these kinds of situations, then we allow um, abuse to take place, and that needs to stop. Uh, I just wanted to refer back to some research that we carried out into the experiences of children um, experiencing domestic abuse and, and their views being taken in child contact cases. And one of the things that, that came across very strongly in that research is that um, the children who were not asked for their view tended to be most likely to have a contact order in place. And those tended to be younger children as well. So it would tend to be younger children that would be going to contact centres in that sense. Um, the other issue that I, I thought it might be helpful for the committee to hear is that I'm aware of an example of where um, a disabled child was treated differently to their siblings in a contact case. Um, and the disabled child was deemed not to be able to, to give a view. And the siblings were. The siblings were very scared of their father. They were not um, told they had to, to have contact, but the disabled child was. So there are some further um, issues with the system in terms of particular groups of children, young people. The, the final thing I just wanted to mention is um, in terms of younger children, there's often an assumption that they won't be able to form a view or that they will be unduly influenced by a parent. Um, and in the research, we had a quote from a, a six-year-old girl and she said, I do not want him anywhere near me or my family. You make me very, very sad. He was very bad to me and the family when I was with him, he broke my heart. I do not want to go and stay with you at the weekend. You swore in my mum's face. Now that's a six-year-old. And if you're telling me that a younger child can't have a view on what it's like to live in that kind of environment, I think um, there's something very wrong with the system that, that we're not able to capture those views on a routine basis. Okay. Um, Morris or Edward, I don't know if you've got any questions. Uh, you have certainly got a question, if yes. I may, is, is just drilling down, if we may, into the situation where contact with a child is through a contact centre as a result of domestic abuse. Um, are, are we sure that, that, and are we convinced that at the contact centre, that, that very subtle coercive behaviour that we've heard about and, and abusive behaviour isn't being continued? And, uh, you know, are we sure that, 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 that we've got systems in place to make sure that doesn't happen? Because that certainly causes some concern to me. I, mean, I think that's, again, a very good question. I would say that where there is supervised contact, uh, our staff are very, very alert to exactly those kind of you know, says tricks and, and schemes that, that people may try to uh, use to continue the abuse or to get information through the child. Um, I think the, so in terms of supervised contact, I think in our contact centres we'd be confident that we'd be picking up on those issues. I think you make a very good point, Barry, about those cases where perhaps, as we know from the research, that domestic abuse coercive control uh, is can be hidden. Um, it's entirely possible uh, that those cases that go through supported contact, where that is an issue uh, that has not been fully brought up and clearly supported contact, whilst it's a safe process, um, it's not supervised to the extent that supervised contact is, and there's the potential for that to happen. So I think you raise a very good point. Can, can I just come back just, just on that? If you're not getting the information on, on, mm -hmm. on the cases coming to you, yeah. it, it, it kind of worries me that you're not knowing what to look for. But are you still convinced? Uh, I, I mean, because it is very important yeah. that this doesn't happen. Are you still convinced it doesn't happen? 
we're not through supervised through through supervised contact we would we would be more likely to have more information about that but there is an issue about the courts not providing our contact centers with sufficient information about the background of the cases that we're dealing with that's a, again it's another gap in the system um, that that is uh, affecting uh, our ability to best uh, ensure uh, that that children and families receive the be the very best service that they can it seems a huge gap yeah uh, Morrison, and I'm going to go back to Angus. And um... yeah. thank you, Chair. Um, um, there's an open question here on the regulation. Question of regulations uh, are covering contact centres. Are there any features that should be specified as a minimum requirement, uh, which would take where the contact takes its place in these centres, uh, that recognises and prioritises the well-being of children? Uh, yeah, if you say just very, very briefly, um, there's not formal external regulation of child contact centres in Scotland. Uh, Relationship Scotland does oversee the standards, the training, the, the quality uh, of our centres. We do uh, quality assurance audits on all of our centres. Mm -hmm. um, I think if regulation was to be brought in, and we would be supportive of that process, um, they would cover many of the issues that we already cover. Um, and that would be to do with things such as the training, ongoing CPD professional development, uh, making sure there's, there's minimum standards uh, put in place across the whole of the country. As I say, it's a, there's been a process of development of child contact um, in Scotland over the last 25 years. And if the next stages uh, mean improving that and moving towards regulation, that's a process that we would support. Mm -hmm. Can I just follow on with that side? It leads me on to the question of funding. Uh, do you have any ballpark figures for what it costs to run a contact centre? I'm not asking for them now, but yeah. is that in your system somewhere that... Uh, yes, we, we could give that information. Uh, I mean, yeah, we could give that information. Yeah, and, and obviously it's just when they're running those, those, those centres as well. Yeah. Yeah. A very yeah. small part of that is government funding. It, currently, 166,000 a year of Scottish government money is being used to uh, fund the work of child contact centres. And as you say, you add that up across 46 centres across the country, that's a small amount. Um, we do receive about 700,000 or so a year from the big lottery, uh, and then there's other charitable uh, money as well. But it's, it's not a lot of money for what we do. And I must, if I could just say, we have if, you know, 400 volunteers and staff across the country who are passionately committed to working with children and families and they put enormous effort into making sure that these are positive experiences for children in some of the most difficult cases yeah. uh, you can imagine and, and I think it's a credit to our staff and our volunteers for the work that they do. Okay, okay uh, thanks convener. Um, I have a question with regard to the family justice modernisation strategy which the, the Scottish Government is looking at and uh, regulation in general. Now, uh, the panel will be aware that um, the Scottish Government has re recently written uh, to stakeholders as part of a, a business and regulatory impact assessment. Uh, it's undertaken in advance of the consultation on uh, the Family Justice Modernisation Strategy. Now, um, included in that piece of work is a, a question about regulation of child contact centres. Um, now, whilst we appreciate that um, the... Uh, panel members here this morning may be contributing to that process, it would help if we could have some indication um, with regard to your views on in, in relation to external regulation uh, and whether there's general support for it. Absolutely. Um, I think it's absolutely crucial um, that there's a, a set of standards Anyone who knows me knows that I'm constantly arguing about sets of standards for our, our own sector um, and consistency across the country. So for me, it's about ensuring that when society says it wants something, we make sure it's delivered. So I would be absolutely in support of regulation um, and some uh, a, a way of ensuring of setting appropriate standards and then ensuring they're met. Okay. Thank you. Um, Marsha, please. Um, <clears throat> that absolutely is a, a question that relates to something I wanted to say anyway, in the sense that I, th I think what we need to look at, ab we need regulation, but I th I, and I think if you think about the enormous contrast between the amount of um, training and monitoring that happens in child protection arrangements in local authorities and, um, and the, the exposure of... of um, women and children experiencing domestic abuse to harm in an unregulated, unprotected, no care inspectorate, you know, um, 
uh, obligations, all, all of that. You, you, you know, it's just, it's just like two different universes. So um, the, 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 the public interest is not served, I think, in that, in that contrast. And I would absolutely protect, um, support a move to monitor it. But I would also like to put in a, a maybe a little bit out of the box thinking about this, which is that I think absolutely that the, the, um, the Child Contact Centers and Relationship Scotland have been given an almost undoable task in some ways. And, and I think that maybe what we could think about is moving away from the bricks and mortar approach to protecting children's interests in this situation and think about, well, what are the the um, the resources that need to be available to courts and to children. So they would be so. For instance, something like a locally well-trained children's services advocate. Now they could meet with children um, in community centers that are set up for children. I mean, we we've all seen fabulous <coughs> settings for children where where both the advocates and then if there's going to be contact with a parent that's deemed safe, it could happen. Um, and I think it's the deeming safe that's not happening. And it doesn't matter as much what the, the bricks and mortar are. It matters the, about the deeming safe and then about the, getting the views of the children and, and, um, and then making sure that the way you order contact responds to their fears and concerns if you do order contact. So it, it doesn't have to be in a child contact center. If we thought about investing that money into the local ability to, to support children and into the early years um, infrastructure and into the, under, the, the resources available to courts for ordering contact, I think um, uh, we, might, we might have a, a, a better system change um, in mind and one that actually delivers across all children in a local area rather than for the ones who are sent, which are, you know, the, most of our children involved in, in um, uh, visitation and custody um, conflicts are not even going through courts. They're arranged separately from the court system. So I think it's really important to think about investing in communities to do this better um, rather than um, trying to support an industry uh, of uh, to do it that that is really quite difficult to, to parachute in. Um, so I think that's really important thoughts about talking to communities about what would help them do this rather than um, automatically investing in a model that's really difficult to deliver and possibly not um, cost effective. Okay. We've really only got about nine minutes left, and there's a few folks still want to come in. On the question of funding, I wonder if you can provide us with information, if not now, later, about charges to those who use the contact centre. Where, I mean, I'm assuming, I don't know who, is it the non-residential parent who would pay, or and what those kind of charges would be like? I don't think we've... You might not have that to hand just now, but it would be useful to get that information. Uh, because I'm happy to provide more information. I say very briefly, many of the cases that go through supervised contact would be covered through legal aid. Um, I, and in the majority of cases, supported contact, uh, there wouldn't be a charge or there may be a small charge for the intake process. Um, I, again, we, wherever possible, uh, we will seek to get... Uh, that through uh, legal aid covering the costs for the majority of people. But in some circumstances, through that. people would be charged. In some circumstances, they would. Um, but the issue is about, uh, for us, the whole issue of ability to pay. If people are able to pay and there's an appropriate charge, uh, then that would be that would be made. Okay. If, I mean, if you can provide us with just what that uh, charge is, give me be like that would be useful. Ian, okay. then Rona, and then we're going to have to pull it together. Mm. Um, Stuart mentioned that, that contact centres have been around for about 25 years. I used to work for one of the organisations who was crucial in, in getting contact centres underway in the first place. And I think they developed as a result of a need. They were very much came from the ground up. So although I can take Marsha's point about things being community-based, I think contact centres have come from that. They've, they've, they've happened because there was a need for places for parents to feel safe in seeing their children. Um, and therefore we should be cautious about trying to throw that out and set up something new when it has, has got that. And I, I would agree with Stuart that I think in, there, there are very dedicated volunteers and very professional staff in current contact centres. They're dealing with a difficult job. They're dealing with two parents who are in conflict. 
obviously, when the addition of domestic violence is added into this mix, they're dealing with all sorts of concerns about safety for children. Um, but I would hope that this committee would take away the view that there is a worthwhile service out there. It needs to be better regulated. I agree with that. We need better training in the court and the child welfare um, service in order to uh, make sure that the right decisions are made. But as I said, the sheriffs who are dealing with this have got a difficult job, and my, I have got confidence that, that there are there are sheriffs there who are doing very sensitive work in this area and not always getting it right, but uh, um, we shouldn't just condemn them as being um, insensitive to, the, to, to the, issue, the, the very serious domestic abuse issues that have been raised by this committee this morning. Okay, thank you, Rona. Just briefly, just to agree with, with Marsha's comments, um, I've got many years' experience in the children's hearing system and the contrast between that getting it right for every child and this system is it's huge and the best contact that takes place is out with the best supervised contact that takes place is out with a social work office it's in a child friendly environment and nothing could take away from that okay well i think there's lots and lots of things for us to to think about there but i, I do want genuinely to thank everybody for their their thoughts today and i think i will be speaking for the committee saying you probably raised a lot of questions for us in terms of how we're going to take the petition and the issues round it forward. And I think it was Rona Mackay who'd said before, that even though she was involved in the hearing system, hadn't really been aware of this whole question and, and some people's very bad experience of contact centres. And I think there's a number of questions, certainly in my mind, that we would look for more information from. Are we inappropriately ending up with young people um, having contact through contact centres because the statutory system is failing? So you're making up for the fact that there's cuts to local government or whatever. Um, this whole question of women being in contempt for not taking their children into circumstances which they feel are harmful. What is the training for um, the judiciary? And it's disappointing that we didn't, weren't able to get a, a somebody to come along from them today. But I think that is a whole question in itself around judicial training, access to judicial training, because there might theoretically be courses available, but if they only run once in a blue moon, then it, it's less um, likely. The question of training more generally, funding, I think there's some consensus here around regulation, certainly from um, yourselves. And um, just to the extent to which people can have confidence in this system more generally, but specifically around domestic abuse cases. I mean, it does again worry me that you're seeing that you might have families coming to you where the courts have not provided you with adequate information, and you're saying that the court reporter is not trained to even draw out the appropriate information. Um, so I'm um, in terms of what we now do, I think I think we're agreed as a committee we want to do some more on this, but I wonder if there are some suggestions about what usefully we, we should be doing. Pauline? I, I just occurred to me sitting here that the issues that we're discussing might be very usefully explored in a children's rights and wellbeing impact assessment, which could set out the different areas that are involved and the different training needs that are required that are setting out where children's rights are being respected and are not being respected. Um, it's being rolled out more widely across the Scottish Government at the moment, and I think it's it could be potentially a useful tool for that to be carried out, um, which I think would set out very clearly where children are invisible in the system. Mm -hmm. I mean, would it be reasonable for us perhaps to get the Cabinet Secretary for Justice in to talk to them about? Because there's a lot of information about very small technical things like the F9 report, the questions that Angus raised about what the government is actually doing, and being able to discuss with the Cabinet Secretary, I mean, particularly since there's a domestic abuse legislation going through, yeah. the extent to which an understanding of that is then going to be fed out into other bits of the system, would that be a reasonable thing to do? Uh, uh, Edward? I, I, I think, I mean, there's been a lot of issues raised which you summarised very uh, effectively, Convener. I think the Cabinet Secretary coming into explain those and, and, and to be quizzed on them I think would be uh, would be important and, and just from a, a personal point of view I think it should be done sooner rather than later because I think there are real issues here that I've heard this morning which give me concern that the system isn't working properly and it may fail people between now and when we get 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 it resolved so I'd quite like to see it done sooner rather than okay, later. Take Marsha briefly then Angus and I think we'll just draw it to conclusion. 
Um, I, I should just say that many of these issues have been raised in the in the discussions um, that Scottish Women's Aid and some of our um, colleagues have been having um, over the last few years, and with the the justice officials writing the domestic abuse bill. Um, and, I, and I would say that th there's a children and young people's um, reference group under Equally Safe that has certainly um, spent a lot of time talking both to officials and, and to stakeholders about the challenges of reflecting the rights and um, needs of children in the domestic abuse bill. Uh, I, I think when I gave evidence to the Justice Committee about the bill last week, actually, one of the things I flagged up was that one of the, one of the areas we think the bill could still be improved is about uh, some uh, appropriate way to reflect the, the, the experience of children as victims. Um, and uh, we, my sense is that the, that the, the government is, is very sympathetic to the problem, but no, doesn't, hasn't seen a, um, uh, a solution to it that might not derail the bill mm -hmm. in general, and, and which of course we would be worried about also. So I, I do think that, the, that it, it would be really welcome if this committee and the work of the, you know, the Justice Committee around the domestic abuse bill were, was talking to each other, in that highly technical phrase. Um, well, but certainly there's what we can evidence. do is ensure that the, it's flagged up to the Justice Committee. This, this event will obviously be on the, um, the official report and we'll flag that up to both the convener and I think to the Scottish Government as well. But Angus, you want to say something briefly? Uh, no, well, just um, to concur with Edward Mountain, I think it's, uh, so many issues have come to light since we, we started looking at this in uh, recent months. Uh, there's there's no doubt that we need to have the Justice Secretary in to, to um, ask him to address some of these issues. Keep I'd agree that, uh, all Chair, I would agree with that. Uh, would it be possible to have somebody, like a sheriff or somebody from the judiciary here to, to give their side of... Can we maybe look at that and I maybe have know. a conversation with people who understand these things better than I do, who are the people who feel able to come in? Well, I shouldn't be able to feel able to come yeah. along and, and discuss these issues, but I mean, we do know from the domestic abuse court experience in Glasgow, there's a lot of people who are very, within a judicial system, mm -hmm. who are very positive about that. So mm -hmm. we just try to find a way of understanding properly what the, their needs are. And I think it would be fair to say again, that we do recognise as many staff and volunteers involved in trying to make contact work for um, people and it's about improving that system for every, for everybody. Um, and I said, I mean, I understand from um, that the, the cabinet secretary is going to be in front of the justice committee next week. So we'll make sure that the information from this round table is available to them. But I, I don't think this is the, you know, I think that as everyone has said, they're very struck by the range of, of issues here, and also the context. Because I'm, I have to say, I'm troubled by the idea that the contact centres are got more complex cases which in the past would not have come to a contact centre, they'd have been dealt with in the statutory system, and that's maybe something I want to explore further. But can I thank everybody very much indeed for their attendance today. I think that was really, really useful. I mean, certainly in terms of reflecting some of the very genuine concerns that the petitioner has brought before us, very important issues. And I think we want to thank the petitioner too for allowing um, that experience to be able to shape some of our thinking and perhaps hopefully shape the provision in the future. And can I suspend briefly while we move to the next item?
call the meeting back to order and we now move to agenda item two, new petitions. The second petition on our agenda today is a new petition, petition 1658, which calls for compensation for those who suffered a neurological disability following administration of the Pluserix vaccine between 1988 and 1992. We have the opportunity this morning to hear from the petitioner and I therefore welcome Wendy Stephen to the meeting. It's good for you are able to come along. We'll start off with a brief opening statement of up to five minutes and then move to questions from members. And once we've concluded our questions, we can consider action that we may wish to take. So can I thank you and just ask you to make your statement? Thank you. Good morning and thank you for inviting me to address you today. I would like to make it clear that the brand of MMR vaccine, which is the subject of my petition, is not in use today and has not been used in the United Kingdom since 1992. The issues I raise are historical in nature, but nevertheless of huge significance to the young people in Scotland who receive Pluserix MMR and as a consequence still suffer with lasting neurological disabilities today. In October 1988, despite the fact that the Urabi-containing Triverix vaccine had been introduced and almost immediately removed from use in Canada in 1986, following concerns that it was causing mumps, meningitis and recipient children, the Scottish Home and Health Department supported and implemented the marketing of Pluserix, a Urabi-containing brand of MMR here in Scotland. After the Canadian authorities had stopped using the vaccine to await laboratory-confirmed test results to conclusively determine whether or not the vaccine was the cause of the meningitis, and the manufacturer voluntarily ceased marketing the vaccine, it was introduced in Scotland. Despite a number of early indications that a similar problem to that encountered in Canada was occurring here, the Scottish Home and Health Department continued to support the use of Pluserix for four years, two of them after the Canadian licence was cancelled in 1990, when it was conclusively proven that the Urabi mumps strain had been isolated from the CSF of the Canadian children. At that time, the Canadians concluded that the vaccine was not considered safe for immunisation of Canadian children, and one has to wonder how anyone could have thought it was safe for Scottish children. Eleven months after its introduction here in September 1989, the Committee on the Safety of Medicines reported 10 cases of mumps meningitis. Dr Alistair Thors was the senior medical officer and named point of contact in the Scottish Home and Health Department circulars, advising that Pluserix was to be one of the MMR brands introduced into Scotland. He also represented the department on the JCVI and the ARVI and was present when the high incidence of mumps meningitis was reported on by committee members. In April 1990, despite the fact that the Scottish Home and Health wrote to the JCVI outlining their concerns as to the incidence of mumps meningitis and questioning whether or not an alternative brand of vaccine should be used, they still continued to support the use of Pluserix on Scottish children. Dr Thors was also present when in May 1990 the JCVI heard that three districts had switched from Urabi containing MMR to the alternative brand, and one has to wonder why Scotland, with very obvious heightened concerns, did not do likewise. The JCVI's statutory functions do not extend to Scotland, and the authorities were not bound to comply either in part or in total with any advice given to them by the JCVI. It was at all times open to the Scottish Home and Health Department to cease using Pluseric and switch to the alternative brand. In September 1992, the Department of Health removed Pluserix from use and it became the subject of an import ban in 2002, at which time the CSM chairman spoke of the risk of potentially serious neurological complication to children. Pluserix was insufficiently attenuated and a defective product within the meaning of the Consumer Protection Act of 1989. Originally estimated to cause mumps meningitis at a rate of case one case per 100,000 doses, scientists in Nottingham provided a laboratory-confirmed rate of one case per 3,800 doses, a significant difference. The Department of Health commissioned a study conducted by the British Paediatric Surveillance Unit of all reported cases of mumps meningitis included a follow-up study a year later to determine any lasting sequelae in the children. 
Nine cases of sensory neural deafness, a condition which is included in the manufacturer's list of possible adverse reactions to Plucerix, were detected in the cohort and reported on in a paper by Stewart and Prabhu. The vaccine damage payment scheme only provides financial assistance to applicants who can satisfy the assessors as to a 60% disability. It is the case that some applicants seeking compensation in respect of the sensory neural deafness following administration of Plucerix have been acknowledged as vaccine damaged but not damaged enough to qualify for a payment. Despite the fact that the Scottish Home and Health Department were aware of both the historical background to Plucerix from Canada and the fact that identical problems had been and were occurring here, parents bringing their children for MMR vaccination were entirely unaware. It is difficult to see how informed consent could have arguably been obtained in these circumstances. Unfortunately, in 2008, Ms Nicola Sturgeon, the then Health Minister, acknowledged that a senior medical officer files were not held centrally within the Scottish Home and Health Department, but retained by individual doctors during their period of employment and destroyed thereafter. It follows that relevant files on Plucerex MMR have been destroyed and are not available to the committee. I respectfully request that the committee consider the way in which this highly problematic, dangerous vaccine was firstly able to enter the Scottish market and secondly to remain there for four years, despite the obvious concerns and problems identified by the Scottish Home and Health Department. To date, the children who suffered lasting neurological disability following the administration of the Plucerix vaccine in Scotland have received neither acknowledgement nor compensation. In 19... 19- 82, Lord Campbell of Alloway in the House of Lords advocated that where a child has been damaged through vaccination in the interests of the community, there should also be absolute liability and fair compensation. Today, on behalf of those who suffered lasting neurological disability following the Plucerix vaccine, I am seeking both. Thank you very much um, for that. And there's obviously a, a lot in there. Can I maybe ask, and you've kind of referred to it, but just to capture it, a um, picture of the scale of the problem and how you think it might be addressed. So do we know how many people in Scotland have been adversely affected by the vaccine? I know you said that there were some that had to be more than 60% disability before they were counted, but are there others? Um, and how do you think the level of compensation should be calculated? I, I have no way of knowing. Nobody has ever collated that information. And have you, but have you got an idea that of how you, how the level of compensation should be calculated? How would that be done? Well, the vaccine damage payment unit, as I said, only um, compensate or pays money to um, applicants who are over sixty percent disabled, which means that you can have people coming in under the sixty percent threshold acknowledged as vaccine damaged, but not receiving payment. But you think they should be. Well, we have the situation where we have a party saying to an individual, you you have been damaged, we acknowledge that you have been damaged, we acknowledge that the vaccine has damaged you, but in our opinion, after assessment, you are not damaged enough to qualify for a payment. And I don't know of many circumstances in life where somebody can say that to a party, my product, I, or something that I am party to has damaged you, but not to the extent that I have to acknowledge that, deal with it and compensate you. Can you think of any examples where somebody has had damage but they haven't had that threshold? I mean, in other, is there anything comparable that you can think of? No. Where people have been treated differently? It doesn't seem to me to be fair. I'm just wondering if there, if there are any examples of where people have been treated more fairly. No. no. OK, Angus? Um, thanks, <coughs> convener. If I could just kind of follow up on that. We, the committee understands that, that payments can be made under the Vaccine Damage Payments Act of 1979. Um, and we also understand that this doesn't prejudice a person's ability to claim compensation through the, the courts. So could you expand a bit further and give us, our th- give us your thoughts on um, the payment scheme under the Act uh, and how it's working for people who have been adversely affected by these vaccines? Well, I don't think it is addressing the problem because it only um, addresses the the people who, as I say, can meet that 60% threshold and beyond that. 
you have the unsavoury situation where people can be told and acknowledged by the VDPU that they have been damaged by the vaccine, but that they haven't been damaged enough, in their opinion, following assessment, to qualify for a payment. OK, thanks. So, yeah, I think we need to get some more clarification on that 60% threshold. It's non-negotiable. The 60% is across the board for everybody. Okay. It used to be 80%, but it dropped to 60%. Okay. But that still means that the assessors who work to the VDPU um, examine the individuals and then say what percentage of disability they feel that person has. There are two hurdles to overcome at the Vaccine Damage Payment Unit. One is to establish um, biological plausibility that the vaccine has caused the injury complained of. And the second part is to meet that threshold of 60%. We have situations where children are meeting that biological plausibility and being acknowledged as vaccine damaged and struggling with their disabilities, but not being assessed as viable for a payment. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. Rona Mackay. Thank you, Convener. Good morning. Good morning. Um, yeah, just just to sort of um, say that this is to some extent historical and that it happened before devolution. Absolutely. But the, 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 the Scottish Government um, can make voluntary payments to people affected by the vaccine. Are you aware of anyone, you know, asking for a payment from the, the current Scottish Government or previous For this particular cause? Yeah. No, I'm not aware not of anybody aware. else. What about um, anyone in other countries? Do you, do you know if there's been any compensation from governments awarded to people in other countries? For this particular cause? Yeah. No, I'm not aware of that. Not every country used Plusrix MMR. Uh -huh. There were many, many countries. America, for example, only ever used MMR2 product. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Scotland implemented three brands of vaccine. Mm -hmm. And when they discovered the problem with Plusarix and eventually removed it from use, they switched to an alternative brand. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I mean, I may have missed this in our, in our papers, but how long have you been campaigning for this? Approximately 25 years. Right. OK. And what, what, sorry, what bodies have you approached about it in that time? I have been to the court in England. I went through the MMR litigation in England. Um, I have approached many ministers. I have approached, and in the early 2000s, my MSP, Mike Rumbles, then very kindly approached the Justice Minister at that time, Jim Wallace, and asked him if it would be possible to bring a litigation in Scotland. Mm -hmm. At that point, I was told no, but I was granted legal aid in Scotland to find out from a solicitor if there was any viability in the claim but it came back that there was no possibility of bringing a case in Scotland. Again, in 2007, I wrote to the then First Minister, Alex Salmond, and asked Mr Salmond why it was that we weren't able to bring a litigation in Scotland. At that time, I was advised that Scottish ministers don't give legal advice. I wasn't seeking legal advice, but um, all I wanted was an understanding as to why we could not bring a legal action in Scotland for these young people. Is, uh, uh, would this have been uh, uh, a vaccine that was available across the United Kingdom? And if so, are you aware of any cases in the rest of the United Kingdom that have been successful? No, because nobody has ever brought an action specifically for Plusarix. The MMR litigation that was held in England included all vaccines and only addressed problems with autism and IVD. So neurological problems that were specific to the Urabi mumps strain contained in the Plusarix vaccine were never looked at. So yours is a very specific issue, which is quite very different from issue. people making a connection between MMR and consequent diagnosis of autism. Yours is quite a different issue, quite but different. it's been established quite that the vaccine was a problem. Yes. Um, Edward Mountain. Sorry, Wendy, thank you, first of all, for giving evidence. Uh, I, I, I'm just struggling a little bit, but I've looked through the papers, and I, I'm trying to come to, to grips with the amount of people that, that you think have been affected by this. Um, I, I understand it's difficult because you don't have the files and they've been destroyed, but do you have an indication of how many other people are, have, have suffered problems? No, I have no... Nobody has ever 
brought these people together under a, a one body. Nobody has ever counted that figure. Nobody has ever attempted to say how many people out there have been affected by this vaccine. What I can tell you at a personal level is that the MHRA have confirmed to me that they had 11 cases of sensory neural deafness reported to them in connection with the Plucerix vaccine. But okay. that's only that one out. type of condition. Okay, and and do you do you think it, it, the deafness is is the only symptom? It's the one you alluded to in your uh, that it was on the papers that could be a side effect. Are there other side effects? That I would imagine there would be other side effects. I haven't personally been involved in any of that. My drive has been more to do with the sensory neural deafness. The sensory neural deafness is listed in the product insert from the vaccine okay. um, as a possible side effect of the vaccine. And also the Department of Health study, which was commissioned to investigate the children who took meningitis after Plucerix, um, determined, I think, was nine cases of sensory neural deafness. So deafness has definitely uh, appeared following the use of Plucerix. Thank you, Camino. I may come back in at the end, if that's right. Morris, um, Morris Corey. Thank you. <coughs> Good morning, Wendy. Good morning. Um, you explained in your evidence that although compensation is available through the courts, people who experience barracks, barriers to accessing it due to issues such as limitation periods that apply? Yes. Um, if the Scottish Government were to agree uh, to make voluntary compensation payments, what principles do you think it would adopt to ensure uh, that the voluntary scheme is suitably accessible and fit for purpose? I would hope my, my, my aim is to secure perhaps an ex gratia payment for these children. Um, I, I, the only way we could go back to a legal process would be if we could go down the road of lifting the time bar. But that's a very lengthy, complicated and not always successful road to go down. Because undoubtedly there would now be t long since time bars mm -hmm. on bringing more legal action on top of the difficulties that I encountered in the early 2000s when I did try to bring litigation in Scotland. At that point, I was told that pro um, the Limitation Act would prevent me from going forward and funding would also be a problem. So if these issues were a problem back in the early 2000s, they would definitely be a problem for young people today. And we would also, as I say, have to go to court probably to ask for the time bar to be lifted to allow us to go forward in that way. Mm -hmm. Can I come back on that one? Have you thought of any action against the company, the manufacturer? Well, that's what the litigation in England right. was about. Yeah. That's what it was about. That's the only defendants that were involved in that litigation were right. the actual manufacturers of the vaccine. But okay. as we've already discussed, that litigation... And is that covered under the time bar? Yes. Right, OK. Thank you. The, 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 um, we, you you've just not been given advice about the ability to have, take legal action against those who then prescribed the vaccine, as opposed to the person who manufactured it. That was what you confirmed that earlier, that the advice you'd been given that you couldn't take... We couldn't do that action. in early 2000s, no. OK, Edward Mountain. So, uh, Wendy, as part of your petition, you're also calling on the Scottish Government to make an acknowledgement of those that have yes. been adversely affected by the vaccine. Could you just elaborate to me how, how, and the committee how, how you see that acknowledgement being made and, and, and perhaps just explain how you'd like to see it delivered? I think what I personally would like would be an acknowledgement um, a statement perhaps acknowledging that there was a problem with this vaccine and that some children, not all children who got it, but some children have been left with lasting disabilities because of it and are still going about today with those disabilities. Okay. Nobody has ever mentioned the word Plucerix before. It's not been spoken about. It's never been approached. It's never been acknowledged. The children do exist. They're young people now. They're young men and women now. Mm. Um, and it did happen to them. But nobody has ever acknowledged that they exist or even addressed their problems or said, let us have a look at this. It's just not happened. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you, Commander. Thank you. I, mean, I think it's the case. I mean, I speak for the committee. It's not something that I was aware of until... I read the papers, and there's a whole number of questions here, including this 
where the threshold lies, why that threshold is established. You've got a problem, but it's not enough of a problem. And these are things instinctively we can see from your perspective that that is something we would want to ask further questions about. So I think I'm very grateful to you for um, bringing the petition forward. And I wonder if there's some suggestions about how we might take this forward. Angus? <coughs> Thanks, Camilla. Well, clearly we, we need to seek the views of the, the, the Scottish Government um, first and, and foremost. Um, but also, uh, it might be an idea to contact uh, the JCBI, uh, MH, MHRA, which has already been mentioned in evidence, and the Committee on Safety of Medicines, uh, just to get, a, get their views on, on the petition. I think that, I think that would make sense. I think in terms of the Scottish Government, we would want to know, first of all, are they aware of the circumstances? Is it something that they've looked at? This whole question, is it something we'd contemplate? Um, payments, voluntary ex gratia payments, and how do you think those would be calculated? And it may be that once we get a response back, we can think about then whether we want to actually take more oral evidence or not. But certainly the, you've posed a lot of questions on an issue that I don't think any of us genuinely were aware of, but we, I think we get a very strong sense from you of just the sense of injustice about what has happened and I suppose part of the injustice may be is not even something that's been discussed. Could I just advise the committee that the MHRA only came into being in 2003 and therefore were not around in 1988 to 1992 when the vaccine was on the market and the Committee of the Safety of Medicines was replaced on the 30th of October 2005 by the Commission on Human Medicines. Okay, I think that would be useful for the clerks to know. We may want to know what, what the predecessor body was to um, the MHRA and, and take advice on who are the organisations that we might get further information from, Morris. Yes, I mean, I, mean, I, I talked about manufacturers there. Would it not be possible to maybe think about the manufacturer appearing in front of us? Can, can we look at that further to see yeah. you know, whether that is something that we can get advice on to? Whether there's because something within that, that there's quite some issues. Yeah, Could I just also perhaps suggest that the only avenue that I think might be applicable for the committee to pursue would be to perhaps approach Dr Thors, who was the man on the Scottish Home and Health Department at the time when this vaccine was very much in circulation and being supported by the Scottish Home and Health Department. In view of the fact that the, the files have all been destroyed, we don't have the luxury of referring to the files, mm -hmm. but that Dr Thors perhaps could be approached to give some background mm -hmm. to this. Can I suggest that what we maybe do is take advice about how best we would get access to information about decisions that are made at that time. It might be through the chief medical officer or whatever, and we're conscious of the difference between somebody's role, the role of the system and role of individuals within it, and I don't think we, we would want to just be careful about that, but um, I think we certainly want to get some sense of how those decisions were made and what the systems were they were in place to kind of test against decisions around vaccines. So Edward? What, one other thing that I, th I think in the evidence I heard from, from Wendy that there was a court case relate or a decision, was it made by Lord Gill or it was made re relating to people who had uh, been injured as a result of being vaccinated in the community benefit for the eradication of disease? Lord you Campbell of Alloway. Yeah, I, I think it'd be useful for the committee to look at that as part of the papers uh, when you look at the next stage as well, because I think it would give a steer um, on the way to deal with this. Morris? Yeah, the other, I think, again, because these papers have been destroyed and we don't have them, I think we should go back also and get some information from the Canadian medical authorities why they stopped it. Well, I'm, I'm sure there'd be some, there must be evidence in the system that maybe reports on why they made mm. that decision. So I could perhaps assist with that. And? I can perhaps assist with that. Um, they, they removed their product because it was causing what they thought at that time was mumps meningitis in the children, but they couldn't be absolutely sure because there was no definitive test at that point to determine that it was undoubtedly the vaccine. But with the passage of time, they developed a test that could determine whether or not the vaccine was the sole cause of the meningitis they were seeing in the children. And once they determined that, once they had laboratory confirmed proof that the meningitis they were seeing in the Canadian children came from the vaccine, 
that they took away the license for the vaccine in Canada. Th thank you. That'd be very useful. Okay, I think there's a lot of um, information gathering that we want to to do um, ahead of our next consideration of the petition. But I think we do recognise it's something that you have brought to the attention of the committee and therefore more broadly on an issue that people have not really... It's not been in the conversation in, in public health at all. So can I thank you very much for that. We will obviously um, gather that evidence and we will have a further session um, in consideration of the petition. So can I thank you very much for your attendance and I'll suspend briefly. order and move to agenda item three new petitions the next petition on the agenda is petition 1654 by ian munn on forestry regulation members of a spice briefing a note by the clerk and a submission from the petitioner the petitioner is calling the scottish parliament to urge the scottish government to develop a statutory code on stakeholder engagement for the forest industry Best, based on CONFOR guidance, is also calling for a Scottish Government body to oversee the implementation of and compliance with this code. The SPICE briefing explains that the Forestry and Land Management Scotland Bill was introduced in 10 May 2017, but does not include provision for a statutory code on stakeholder engagement for the forestry industry, as requested by this petition. Members will see that the petition, petitioner's submission sets out in more detail how local people can be affected by a lack of consultation with the industry. And I wonder if any members have any comments or suggestions. And one of the things I, I was struck by was the petitioner's comments on the degree of damage they can cause, damage to roads, damage to verges, um, forestry that's obviously been planted many, many years ago is now being harvested, but there's not any obligation to work um, with local communities around that, and I think that's clearly something that we can understand the level of concern there, and I wonder if people have views on, on, on what the petitioner says. Okay. Can I Edward? Uh, just one thing, if it helps the committee, it's not something that's at all covered in, in, in the uh, forestry bill that's just started to come through the Rural Economy and Connectivity Committee. Uh, and, and we have heard evidence um, and the committee, the Rural Economy Committee, have seen the damage that can be caused to roads uh, as a result of forestry. And it's one of the issues that was brought up to the uh, committee on one of the forestry visits that we did. So, I mean, it is a, it is a genuine concern. Um, and uh, as it falls out with the bill, it may be that it's more... Uh, for this committee to uh, contact the Scottish Government and, and find out a bit more about this, to find out whether they would deal with it more in the regulations or the guidance to the bill, which where it isn't at the moment. Why do you think it's out with the bill? I mean, I accept that it is, but have you got a view on why it wouldn't have been included? If um, it was very evident to the committee that there was an impact? Well, uh, in... It's probably too early to say, and I, I probably shouldn't answer for the committee. It's very interesting yesterday at the evidence session uh, that it appears as well, and from certainly reading the bill, there's a lot about felling in the bill, huge sections of felling in the bill, which probably was covered by regulation before. And, and the committee is still looking at why some things are within the bill and out with the bill. But uh, the, the whole issue of consultation would probably fall within a regulation 
as far as uh, grant schemes in the future. But I don't think it covers the, the, the issue that the, the, the petitioner is bringing to this committee. Because it does talk about verges, roads, but also impact of, of traffic, which is already, and I think, on some examples of roads in which we've already got petitions. So, Angus? Yes, thanks. <coughs> Convener, I've certainly got some uh, sympathy with the petition, um, and I've certainly seen it firsthand the, the damage that can be done uh, by uh, heavy trucks moving timber. But um, there has been an attempt, as, uh, as I recall, um, by the Scottish Government to move the transportation of timber from road to, to sea uh, through an initiative called uh, Rad Namara, which is a Gaelic mm. for a uh, road of the sea. Um, and the Forestry Commission have been heavily involved in that, so um, I'd be keen to get... I mean, I've, I've seen it in practice um, on the Isle of Mull and uh, some other West Coast sites. Um, so it'd be good to get some more information on that. But, um, you know, it's, it's important to clarify that attempts have been made yeah. up till now. Uh, that, um, well, that the very fact that there's a bill addressing this whole question, the question of forestry, tells us that the Scottish Government's aware of it. Um, it'd be useful to know what these initiatives are yeah. and the limitations of them, or the benefits of them too. Yeah. So I think we would be wanting to write to the Scottish Government. Mm -hmm. The Scottish Government does actually have a uh, network of roads that are approved for forestry and, and forestry extraction routes and limitations on the road, which I believe is agreed with local authorities who would be responsible in many cases for maintaining those roads. And it may be that the committee feels that it might be appropriate to take up with the Scottish Government whether that needs to be reviewed as part of the forestry bill in, in the wider scheme of things. But there is a very basic outline of routes that are available for people to use, not to, you know, the, the land ones, and I'm, I, I'm not sure what, what the, um, the, the terms would be for it. But. Morris? Yes, um, again, I've experienced the same with Argyll and Butte. We, we've gone quite a long way with that with the Forestry Commission. Sorry, my old interests of being a councillor. Uh, around St. Clair, um, and uh, they have gone onto the sea in a lot of the stuff. There's still a fair amount of travelling, and I do know <clears throat> that I think we should, uh, certainly I think we should put uh, Cosler on the map here and in mm -hmm. to get them for us, but there is something certainly going on there that's improving would more, it. Would it be more logical rather than Cosler to identify the local authorities for whom this would be an yeah. issue and speak to them? Because I think the issue is whether consultation with local authorities extends them to communities yeah. who might okay. have a direct yeah, yeah, impact. Yeah. Um, so it's the Scottish Government, CONFOR, Forestry Commission, Scotland, mm -hmm. and, industry bodies, yeah. and the various industry bodies, mm -hmm. and others of an interest, Woodlands Trust, mm -hmm. um, and perhaps any others that the clerks can establish that would maybe have a view on this. But I think we, we recognise there may be an issue here, there may be an opportunity in the legislation, but there are also already initiatives yeah. so trying to put it into that context. And, and we obviously can then, if we make contact with... Um, these bodies are suggested then, obviously, it's something we can look at further. Is that agreed? Yes, agreed. Agreed. Okay, thank you very much for that. In that case, can we move on to petition 1656, Threats and Assaults on Sitting Members of Parliament, their staff and families. The next petition on the agenda is petition 1656 by Rob McDowell on threats or assaults on sitting members of Parliament, the staff and families, members of a spice briefing, a clerk's note and a copy of the petition. The petition is calling on the Scottish Parliament to urge the Scottish Government to bring forward the specific legislation which would introduce a statutory aggravation for assaults or threats against the safety of the life of elected members and their staff or families. The petitioner highlights the fact that statutory aggravations exist in Scots law, such as assaults against police officers, and in his view, similar aggravations should be in place for parliamentarians, their staff and families. And I wonder if members have any comments or suggestions. It's kind of difficult to do special pleading, I suppose. Um, one of the things that has happened, and it's been in the life of the parliament, is that there have been, through the emergency workers' legislation, a desire to identify groups of workers who put themselves at public risk and may suffer assault. You know, the idea that the fire service being ambushed, um, and which was what drove a lot of that early legislation. And then there was a conversation about actually there are other groups of workers who are also vulnerable, whether it's shop workers, workers refusing to uh, serve people because they're underage or they're under influence of alcohol. 
Um, and this feels like an extension of that and understand the motivation behind it. But you can, I think there has often been a, at what point, if you identify different groups who are vulnerable, who is left behind? Because very often people in their workplace are, are vulnerable. So I'm, I'm understanding the motivation behind it. I think we've all had experience, yeah. particularly with threats to our staff, um, which I've certainly um, regrettably had to deal with. Um, but I suppose the question is whether having a statutory aggravation is something that we think is worthy of pursuit. I think it might be worth you know, like seeking out the views of different organisations in this. Is it possibly somewhere hidden that it actually fits under some existing legislation? That was my concern reading through this. I think often that is the case, mm. but it's like, I think the motivation by earlier legislation was to name the crime. And you can understand yeah. in the context of the terrible things that have happened, you know, to Joe Cox and so on, you can mm. understand people recognising the vulnerability of elected representatives. I would extend it actually to local authorities and other elected members as well, who very often in the front line when people are feeling let down by the system, frustrated by the system, or have an hostility to the system. So I think that argument about naming the crime is very often why it was ha it happened. Right. It's just a question of whether, in reality, does it give more protection mm -hmm. than, mm -hmm. than currently? Yeah, does fine. it deter people? I suppose is the bigger question that people have, have looked at. So I, d I don't think anyone is disputing the motivation behind the petition and recognising the vulnerabilities, particularly of our staff, is a question of whether there's a legal dimension to that or whether actually there are other things that we can do just to make sure that people are safe. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think it might be worth it. I, mean, I don't think we're suggesting we close the petition at this point. I wonder if we, we do look to see what people's views are. Seek further information, yeah. Um, whether we, write, we can write to the Scottish Government, um, the Crown Office and other uh, legal organisations, the police, Scottish Sentencing Council. I think really, but to emphasise that it, it's simply to test the proposition in, in the petition. We haven't taken a view on it at this stage. I think that would be fair. I think that's right, yeah. Anybody get any further comments? Is that agreed? Yes. Okay, yes. thanks very much for that. Um, if we can then move on to agenda item four, a continued petition was petition 1637 on ship to ship oil transfers and trust port accountability. And can I welcome John Finney, MSP, um, who has attended this meeting for this item. This is a continued petition that we pre previously considered. Members have copies of the submissions we've received, including a response from the petitioner to those submissions. In deciding what further action may be appropriate for us to take in this petition, members may wish to reflect on the fact that we don't have a role in relation to the circumstances of any particular cases that may lead people to petition us for a change in national policy or practice. And I wonder if members have any comments or suggestions. I don't know whether, John, it might be worthwhile asking you maybe to comment at this point on where you think issues are in relation to the petition and your involvement with it. Uh, uh, good morning, Kamira, and thank you for allowing me to join your committee for this particular issue. I think you're right to, to say that the, the focus has to be on process rather than any particular um, uh, live claim or otherwise. And I have to say that uh, I, I don't believe that there is a, a widespread public understanding of the process. Um, I mean, for instance, I would want to, to know why Scottish Government ministers fail to see that there's a role for themselves in it. I mean, we understand Marine Scotland did a number of reports. Um, where are these reports? Who caused them not to be uh, advanced? Can they be recovered from a bin and, uh, and an explanation given why why they weren't used? Um, I mean, there is also the question, which having said what I did say, that, that I mean, there was a significant inadequacy about the initial application uh, and how the various authorities should respond to that. Um, it, it's important, um, to note, of course, that SNH and SEPA did provide responses, so that there, there, there is a role, um, and disappointingly, Marine Scotland didn't. So it, it's what the wider implications of that are um, that I, I, I think we need to, to understand, uh, the clarity of process, um, um, and also in, in relation to the governance of ports, um, I think there's a distinct lack of clarity there. I can see that, um, you know, um, public bodies uh, can be democratically accountable, commercial bodies may or may not be accountable to shareholders. 
where some of the trust port sits in the level of accountability, I, I think there's big question marks around that, and I think there needs to be clarity around that. Okay, any other comments? Angus? Yeah. Um, Edward, sorry. Can, can I just, um, I, slightly to support what John's saying, is I think there's certainly a, a lack of understanding on who can input and who, who can't input in, into this whole process. Um, certainly, you know, SEPA's role, SNH's role, and Marine Scotland's role, I think, I think is vital. And I, th I think it's also vital that as those departments work for the Scottish Government, that the Scottish Government uh, f make sure that they're aware of, of those reports and, and support them when they go up uh, to the next level, which doesn't appear to happen. And, and therefore, I, I can understand why this petition has arrived here. I can also understand that, you know, that maybe the application has been withdrawn, maybe there's another application coming, maybe we don't know what's happening. But I think people need some clarity. And I think that the, by this petition coming forward and, and by focusing the government's attention on it and, and actually asking them to be more clear in what they're doing, I think is useful. So you would be suggesting that there be liaison between the Scottish Government and the... Um UK government on the process? Well, I, I think the Scottish government, first of all, has got to make sure that it understands what all the agencies that report to it are saying, and that the Scottish government should, should come up and, uh, and make a posi a peti uh, their position clear on it. Mm -hmm. Because I'm not sure that the petitioners, um, and certainly Cromarty Rising, uh, understand where the Scottish government and what the Scottish government uh, has done. I mean, I may have got that wrong, but that's my understanding yes, of it. It's important to note that Scottish ministers don't have regulatory powers in relation to licences for ship to sh ship oil transfer, and that's just the way it stands. I mean, there's that's a clear, you know, that's a clear matter of fact. But, but John's Can, wanting, sorry, yeah, John's I, I understand clarity on the role on, on of the, the agencies that I sit within that, the Scottish yeah. government. Yeah, I do. Yeah, I and the extent that. to which the Scottish government is informing thinking at UK level around licensing, I think. Yeah. I, 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 think, I, I think the position is, uh, and I totally understand the legislation, and, it, and yeah. it's, it's the MCA that, that ultimately will, will make the decision mm. on it. But, you know, the Scottish Government clearly will have a view on this. Um, they have a view on a lot of things that, that and, and rightly so, that perhaps they can feed into the UK Government, but they don't have ultimate control on, and they should make their position clear on this. Are you meaning a view on the on the particular proposal or on well, the process? Uh -huh. on, on the view on the on, on the pr proposal based on the information that's been given to them by the agencies that form under them, hence SEPA, SNH, and and uh, Marine Scotland. Okay. Angus. Yeah, <coughs> thanks, Camina. I think I should declare an interest in that um, I, along with others, successfully opposed a uh, ship to ship oil transfer. A application in the first of fourth in 2006-2007, um, and I spoke in support of uh, uh, Cromarty Rising during John Finney's members' debate in in the chamber. Um, I'm actually at a loss to understand where the Scottish government is on this one just now because uh, they were very vociferous in 2007 uh, with regard to the first of fourth application. So. Um, there doesn't seem to have been the same uh, action taken uh, at government level as, as there was at that time. Um, John's raised some valid points regarding the lack of accountability with regard to, to port trusts. Um, I, I would um, certainly tend to agree with Cromarty Rising uh, with their suggestion that we should take account of the fact uh, highlighted by them that current Scottish Government guidelines for trust ports in Scotland aren't binding in law uh, and the petitioners call for greater Scot uh, Scottish trust port accountability to, to Scottish ministers um, and I think they, there is a, an extremely valid point there. Um, many of the port trusts, for want of a better term, seem to be a law unto themselves and uh, it's maybe an issue that needs to be looked at. at um, uh, at, uh, in, in greater detail. Uh, they also make a valid point um, with regard to uh, the need to change the sequence of steps in the licensing process uh, and introduce a pre-submission step where compliance with Scotland's National Marine Plan 
the European Protected Species Licensing Habitats Regulations and Independent Financial Assessment is conducted prior to an STS licence application being submitted to the Maritime and Coast Guard Agency. I think these are all valid points and they should all be included in any contact we have with the Scottish Government on this. Okay, I think that's helpful. John? Yeah, um, I, I, I think what I would want to be in a position as a parliamentarian, and it's not to understand the minutiae of the legislation that's involved, but to, to refer any constituent who wish to understand the process to a very clear uh, sequence of events. And, uh, and I don't think it's helpful, and this isn't, I'm, I'm, I'm not, this is not a partisan, it shouldn't be a partisan, it's not helpful for the Scottish Government to go, it's nothing to do with us, when clearly we have a submission in response from the Scottish Environment Protection Agency talking about where the competent authority is mindful of the standards set by Scottish d domestic legislation. Now, um, the environment doesn't know boundaries anyway, so this isn't about constitutional matters, this isn't about party political matters, this is about a standing, a process to ensure that all the legislation comes to deliver to ensure the maximum protection for our environment. And, and, and if we have that, then there shouldn't be a, a undue impact. But it is, it, there's a very, very close link, uh, as, as Angus has said, with the accountability process and when we're told about reference to communities. Well, Nairn is directly on the other side of the water and there was no contact there. And again, there's a very vibrant community campaign wanting to understand the process and wanting to know that whether to be another application, and hopefully there won't be, um, but whether to be the due process has been followed. So, so, I mean, you know, why would Marine Scotland prepare reports and then them not be utilised? They're there, they, they, they were prepared in good faith to serve as a process. So I think everyone needs to understand that process. Okay. Given what you've said, Angus, how do we take it forward? What, what is it that we would then do in terms of get more information? Well, I think we, we certainly need to write to the, the Cabinet Secretary um, highlighting the, the, the points that Cromarty Rising have, Cromarty Rising have read, raised um, and also uh, ensure that the Scottish Government does engage with the UK Government and ensure that the Marine Scotland report is uh, submitted. I'm not sure if it has been or, or not, but uh, maybe Mr Finney well, could clarify. I think that would be dependent on, on a live application, but uh, mm. um, okay. I, I think it's, it's good to, to try and make our understanding of the process on the basis of what's happened, because well, clearly there are flaws in the process here, never mind the application, and uh, th there should be a very clear understanding of who does what, when, and what the relationship is. Ultimately, there's no dispute who makes the decision, as Edward said, it is a, it's a reserve matter, but it has to be an informed decision. So we would be writing to the Scottish Government asking them what do they think, what they think the changes in the process would be that would help to allow them to inform the decision around mm -hmm. what information is provided to the UK Government. Um, and, you know, what is their submission going to be to the UK Government around the licensing process? Have I got that? Yeah. Can, can I also say, sorry, Camino, is that I... I, I I think that it's, it's all very well for the Scottish Government to submit reports from, from agencies. I think the Scottish Government also has to take a position itself on, on, on the reports that are submitted to it. it you know, I, I can't see in any other organisation that wouldn't happen, that, that they would make their position clear at the same time. And I think that's got to be part of the process. And I, I would go one step further to, is, is maybe to help focus and, and continue this going, and, uh, and uh, probably you're not going to thank me for this. I, I actually think the petition should be kept open until this process is completed. Okay. And just yeah, it, it, I mean, it has to be said, um, and, and just reiterating, the Scottish Government did take a position in 2007, mm -hmm. uh, just after the election. So, um, you know, not on this one, but not on this one. So, you know, on a similar one, on a, yeah, similar one. identical, virtually. Okay. So, so. We, we should be writing to the Scottish Government, asking them how they think the system should be improved, the information that they've got and their view of a proposal can be fed into the licence system. So if the decision is made at a UK level, in assuring certain knowledge that this is the view of the Scottish Government, they're not saying they want to make the decision for them, but they're telling them what their view is yeah. um, and how the process, and also what they're doing to improve the process. And I think there is an issue here about how the trust ports work and they would maybe want to ask for the response on that as well. Is that everything? Yeah. Yeah.
Okay. So would you keep the petition open then? You wouldn't. Yes. 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 Well, if, if we're if we're asking for um, a response, then we would keep the petition open until such Thank time you. as we've, yeah. we've got that confirmed. response. But we are, are, are very alive to the fact that it's not about the specific proposal. It's about the process of any such proposal. I'm trying to learn from that um, the concerns that the petitioners have highlighted to us. Okay. So that's agreed. I think that's has come to the end of the agenda, so can I close the meeting and thank you for your attendance.